to yeah. Christine Enville. So last time we kind of talked about, I guess, the start of your journey. You know, we, we started talking about your relationship and how you got into physique sports. I think we kind of got up into that point. And then yeah. we were talking about your professional career with nutrition. And we can kind of digress and keep going on that chain. We'll, we'll still talk about this stuff because it's super interesting. And I could talk about that all day. I'm sure you could as well. Um, yeah. But I think we were kind of at a point where you were just starting to realize the potential of your physique. And you were just starting to, I think, compete competitively or getting to like a higher echelon of competition. So, I mean, if do you want to go down that route? Or I, I guess talk we about can. I, I mean, trying I'm, to, I'm trying to take myself back there because I'm yeah. just I'm interested in it, and I've found a lot of people were. So, I mean, whatever you want to share, and then okay. we can we can we'll go off on um, avenues like this for the listeners because I think that's important, and I think kind of that little takeaway we'll get to it is often reference my coach dr coke joe dr joe klemzeski you know 60 years old he's done all the lane norton coached basically coached all the people that people would know on these on social media yeah. platforms that where it all comes from or one of the main key contributors and what i've learned from him again it's like you come full it, it is actually really simple but we avoid the elephant in the room which is and you probably tie this in with your career here like it's actually no, i think sometimes we add variety and complexity to avoid hard work well, doesn't that feel hard though when you're adding, like anytime you add complexity to something, it feels hard. It's like busy for being mm. busy for the sake of being busy. Yeah. You feel like you're doing something because you're you're spending time in the yeah. gym. I and, think it's and a way it, for us to justify it, right? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Like, and, it, and it's lift away. <laughs> <laughs> which is, when done properly, is incredibly hard. Like mentally, I think we did talk about that, how a lot of the time it's actually mm. your mind is lifting the weight because it's that Correct. damn hard. Yes. Whereas when something's got to have a count and a this and a that, and it, it's like that is almost um, the distraction. It is. Uh, but, in, but, I mean, it has its place, and it has its place, I think, when people are very mature into training mm. or trying to avoid um, injury in some cases because mm. that's the only thing, like, now, and I, this is probably a totally different path that we're going down, but, like, when you're in your 20s, what you could do when you're in your 30s, and some of the stuff that you do, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, and you mm. think, okay, maybe if I had as deployed more of that complex type training though what would the result have been and it's you, you can never know like you can never know the impact that it had because you can't go back and relive through that mm. you can't ever see would you have the same result from a, a muscle size and growth point of view and you can't ever see if it would have had the same result from an injury later mm. point of view so it's a very interesting thing and the other thing that i think is that is the young body meant to respond to that type of training? Because I know that um, some of the, like the SST type training, which is very complex in the, the structure of the sets and the reps and the mm. counts and mm. how that's all done. And it's touted really as a, a advanced training when you get at a plateau, because you can only progressively overload to so far. Like we were talking about, you can say, you know, if hundred kilos is this exercise, you're not going to be go to 200 and then 300 and 400 and 500 like there becomes a, a limit to what you can physically lift mm. and at that point there um, you might hit that after 10 years of training and then what do you do like how do you continue to stress the muscle because you can't simply just go heavy as though it, more time under tension is it volume what is it and that's I think where that particular method came in so I guess my curiosity is if someone's early in their career and hasn't maxed out that ability to reach the top of what they can physically lift mm. does that method still work or is it only working on people who've already kind of reached that limit so it's all of those things which you can't really go back and answer those questions because you can only like have your career once you can only live through it once so mm. um you know there's there's potentially studies for people to do that type of thing like if a young person trains that way trains that way you know is there an impact but mm. You know, you, you, you have what you had uh, and, you know, my training was what it was and it was, you know, very basic, very simple and very, you know, maxing out in all ways the you know, the, the strength for the number of reps in the traditional bodybuilding sense. Mm. Um, so, but that's a, that was a, just a digression from, <laughs> from my, my physique and, and um, realising that there was potential in it. Mm. Um, but that's what, um, I guess... Yeah, like you, you hit a point in competing where you realize that you do actually respond differently to other people to the same work. Yes. Or your workload might be different to other people's and you just assume that everyone's training the same. Mm. So, and again, those are things where now um, there's so much stuff out there. You can get visibility of 
how different people are training. Like everyone's putting their training sessions up on social yeah. media and stuff. Back in our day, you saw who was training in the gym and that was really all you saw. You didn't see how you tr- your competitors were training. You just all turned up a competition and, and yeah. there you were and you didn't even know who really was turning up until you turned professional and then like a month out, you knew who was turning up. Uh, but, you know, I always just used to take the mindset that everyone was actually training harder than me. Mm. So that everything that I did, there was somebody out there that I didn't know about who was, you know, absolutely putting that extra um, couple of reps on every set or, um, you know, going a little bit harder on their cardio or cutting their diet a little bit harder than what I was. And that would always, you know, keep me honest, I guess, so that I didn't slack because if I'm, so that other person's not slacking. Mm. They might have been. I'd get to comp and find out that they actually all had been. But, <laughs> but, it, but it, yeah, but it's interesting. That's a good mindset. I mean, two points there, one, I think, like just to go back, you said uh, everything has its place to a degree. I think you, you're right there. You know, it's if we look at something uh, and cherry pick it, or we look at something in isolation, mm. it's hard to say, oh, well, that no. And I think to kind of, I'm just trying to encapsulate this for the listeners and the viewers, you know, everything is a tool with training and there's a time and a place yes. to use that tool. But depending on where you are with the journey or what your outcomes are, how you respond is how you use it. So, mm. you know, we think about, say, chicken. There's a hundred ways to make chicken, but ultimately it's still chicken. You know, yeah. we can flavor it up, we can grill it, we can this. <laughs> and I think that's the problem. Like you said, there's so much information. People are confused now mm. where ultimately it's like, let's kind of go back to the philosophy or the basics. That will give you the answers. And then from there, it's about with your particular body and results it's documenting it's writing it down and then going well what's you know where's the threshold for me yeah and making adjustments and and that and i and the the real thing is that because i also believe you never live in regret Mm. so whilst you know i'm turning 50 soon very soon actually (laughs) (laughs) it's Um, all right it doesn't get that's it stops there christine 50 and that's it yeah (laughs) and 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 yeah injuries are starting to be a a major part of my life (laughs) But I'm, but I'm never going to go back and say, oh, if I hadn't, have, you know, I shouldn't have done what I did. I shouldn't have trained how I did because mm. it was part of what made my physique what it was. Mm. I and I have to believe that and and believe that you know it, my body kind of told myself at different points when to change. So, yeah. for example, in the early part of my career, training twice a week, doing a certain type of volume. And if I didn't train like that, I saw the results not be what I wanted them to be. Yeah. If that makes sense. So I had so I would continue to do that. Then when I got into my late thirties and came back, you know, again it was an injury and feeling my body and then realized, okay, I need to back this off and once a week is enough for everything. But hitting it really decently once a week. And that, mm. you know, my body really, really did well. And then it was, you know, hit another point and I realized like, okay, no, now I need to this is not for my body anymore. Like it it, it kind of teaches you and tells you mm-hmm. or I could have worked at a sub a, potentially a suboptimal level maybe not achieved certain things but maybe I'd be 50 with no injuries mm. but it, but as I mean it's those things where in hindsight you can't go back and and I honestly believe through um like through each decade there's it's like things change mm. and it's whether it be your training whether it be your diet there's certain things that you can do as a 20 year old in your 20s the way that you eat the way that you recover you can be a lot slacker on your nutrition uh, mm. in that age bracket. And then as you kind of go into your 30s, then other things change and you have to become mindful of certain things. And then, again, it's in that kind of early 40s, everything changes again and the mm. way that you work has to change. And now at 50, I'm like, oh, God, here comes another lot of changes. You know, like mm. there's every every decade it seems like something in your body changes and you have to evolve evolve yeah like the macro ratio the meal timing uh all of those things you know that that is you can't just see something as a 50 year old and tell every 20 year old okay now this is how you need to eat because the person's 20 and you can't be married to just one way of doing things you have to be open as you like you said evolve which is probably a a salient point it's kind of before as well you said um you used to train as if people were always working harder than you you know i had a conversation with nathan wallace about this one time and he used to say to me he goes i'm always training because i'm imagining the person who i don't know is going to turn up meaning the person who never posts anything (laughs) and they are freaks and they're out there they live in the country or live they don't post anything and they just turn up they love it and they're just massive shredded and you're like oh my god and like obviously you can't do but like it is 
it, that that little mind game is good because it keeps you working hard because mm. it's not the person that's showing everything on social media it's the person who is not talking and just yeah. getting it done that you need to be that's your competition right there exactly and, and that and the th- that, that actually starts from i remember the early show that i'd gone to even before i was competing mm. I don't know if people remember a guy called Tony Rossi. Like, this is going back to, like, the 90s or something. You know who Tony is? I've heard of his name. He never – I think he never really turned pro or anything. He was an amazing Victorian competitor, but a lot of dif- – different things happened and he never actually – like, he may have won the Australians, but he never went to the next stage. Mm. Phenomenal physique. But um, I remember the first show I saw him at, you know, some big guys walking around and it's like, you know, flexing and he's just – he's really quiet, just totally covered up, looked like nothing. Like, he really looked like nothing. Mm. Um, in his clothes. And then when he stripped off and he was like the most shredded and there was just like muscle popping everywhere and we we're like, holy oh, wow. shit. Sounds like a Frank Zane character. Like yeah. not massive, but like very quality. Yeah, but also so unassuming in clothes. Mm, so like, because there was, you know, guys Wear, wearing... Like, the clothes, yeah. Yeah, the clothes and like, making their traps look big and they were all looking like, you know, biceps hanging out and he was just like <laughs> totally covered. That's cool. And just quite, just stripped everything off and everyone just went... Oh. <laughs> Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> we're in trouble. So, That's, it's yeah, yeah I, I so, do like that approach. There is something quite humbling about yeah, that. Yeah, but but definitely, and it must be a real Aussie thing where we imagine that person who's like in the outback somewhere with the, the home gym <laughs> <laughs> in the outback. That'd be great. <laughs> and they're just like Training they're lifting away, heat. no distractions or anything. But but yeah, I think I, I think that because um, what I see nowadays with a lot of competitors, they actually get focused because they kind of know who's doing the shows and they get focused on that person too much instead of looking still at themselves and what they need to do because you can only bring your physique Mm. and that all comes back to the genetics you know you can't change your hip structure you can't change your thigh sweep you can't change what god god gave you you can build and enhance but if your bicep is short your bicep is short Mm -hmm. if your quad insertion is short it is short you you cannot you know you cannot move where that is so you can really only focus on enhancing your physique, bringing your best physique and doing everything that you can do. So, but in that same time, thinking that everybody's actually doing as hard, if not harder than you, because that, I think that's the the ultimate thing. If you kind of think like, oh, I'm allowed to have this slack day, I can, you know, miss cardio today, or I can eat an extra couple of hundred calories, it won't make a difference. Over the period of the, um, the prep, comp, yeah. the prep, it will. Yes, you know, it, it, it will, unless it's kind of planned or structured. But if you're, if you have a plan and then you deviate from that, then sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, that, that, that is the difference though. Yeah. You're right. So, so it's, so it's part of it is keeping that person in mind, but not, but don't dwell on it. It's more just that's that presence of mm. there's, yeah, there's somebody, there's always, cause it is that saying, there's always someone who's going to be better than you, richer than you, mm, exactly. smarter than you, <clears throat> move faster than you have, have a you know more natural gift than you at something. So that person sitting there, but focusing on what people are putting to show you is, is detrimental because then you kind of get too focused on their prep and forget about your own prep. Mm. And that's what you really need to still be mindful of is, you know, maintaining health and, looking at the things that you can bring into that prep to make it better and better without doing too much. And that's that fine line as knowing what's overkill and what's enough. Yeah. And, and that, that, and that is an art and that absolutely. only comes with experience. I, I must admit as well, I've seen a lot of, you know, trust in the process, like you said, with, with what you're doing, you know, yeah, sure. You're not, you're still respecting what's around you, but you're focusing on what you can control, which mm. is the key. Again, people are so focused on what they can't control. I'm like, well, you can't control it. So don't worry about it. But yeah. You know, I've seen so many competitors come into shows and people go, oh, he's bigger than me, you know, she's this or she's got better that. And then they actually don't do well because there's the execution of the conditioning element doesn't yep. usually get achieved by a lot of athletes. They don't actually get lean enough and they can't present mm. it on stage. Uh, and I've seen athletes who are a lot smaller, but they look a lot bigger because by the time they get to the end result, they've done all the other things or they've pushed harder. They've been able to get themselves to that point. And you're like, wow, like that is unbelievable. The difference that you can make. So you can't get in your own head about how someone looks six weeks out, 12 weeks. Again, you've just got to focus on what you can do and do your best. So when you're on stage, whatever happens, you go, well, you know what? I left no stone unturned. And if I didn't get whatever, like whatever result I got, that's it. And you detach emotionally because at the end of the day, I always say as well, there's what six judges or whatever it is, six, seven, depending on the show. 
you could have had a different breakfast and made a different result. Do you know? <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like sometimes, well, I mean, I'm a human. You're a human. We're all human. Some we make decisions sometimes flippantly, and I'm not mm. saying that you know judges do, and they should be by all the criteria. And I'm, I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt, but. There is a point where it could have just, you could have won different colored trunks. There could have been just something in your posing. And so you have to just, you know, because people get really upset about it. Mm. I'm like, that's, I understand that. You take it seriously, but I don't think you can let it reflect on your self worth, you know? And, and it's hard our sport because we stand on stage half naked and compare ourselves. Yeah. And it doesn't get much more vain <laughs> than that. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, we're comparing that, our genetics. <laughs> well, and, and that's exactly that. And it, and it is, um, you know, remembering that there's literally, there's the three criteria there's the shape, size, and conditioning. Yeah. As well as, like, it's all the, the things which influence, which you don't realise are influencing. And, it, you know, I've been told things like, oh, don't wear a sparkly bikini because of distracting this. Or don't put your hair like that. Or don't, like, like there's so many things that you get told. <laughs> and you're like, are the judges really that bad that they that, that distracts them? Yeah. I'm like, who am I being judged by here? But yeah. I, I don't, I've, I've said it now, haven't I? But that's what I used to think. When people would yeah. say that, I'd be like, seriously? Like, how bad are these judges then if that's if that will distract them? Because as a judge, I always felt like you could focus in on the, these things. However, within that, there is the three criteria. Mm. And if you put, um, you know, a bunch of people on stage and someone is bigger and not as cut and someone is a little bit smaller but more shredded or someone has an amazing shape, isn't quite in the condition mm. or doesn't quite have the size, there's three variables that you've got to choose from. And I know um, from, you know, from experience – that often, you know, I'll be sitting next to somebody and they would go for the, you know, the biggest, slightly less cut person. Correct. And Slice. I'd be looking nut sliced and yeah. that because I knew what it took to get sliced. Like, okay, there's a couple of kilos difference there, but I know from a competitive point of view what prep is involved to get to that and to still maintain that size. So I'm going to give it to that person. So there's that aspect as well, that they're not actually judging outside of the criteria, but mm. there's that combination of criteria in which you're allowed to put your own personal preference forward. Mm. And that is, I think, the thing which competitors can find hard to take is if you do have a bunch of judges who judge a little bit less towards condition and more towards size and shape and you're super conditioned, um, then, you know, you're going to miss out. Now, the, obviously, the current trend, and I'm going to talk about women's physique, for example, mm -hmm. shredded is in. You know, it wasn't five years ago, but, mm. you know, I think with the girl who wins is Sarah, I can't think of her surname, but, you know, the totally shredded glutes, mm. looking around what the criteria has become, that is what they're looking for. So, mm. it, you know, that almost becomes a trend and becomes a fashion mm. as to what they're looking for in the judging. And like anything, whether it be a, a trend in, you know, a social media trend or a trend in fashion, a trend in what people are into, yeah. it's the same thing with, and even just physiques outside of the sport, you know, we've been through the seventies when it was the ultra skinny and now it's all about like the big butt. And, you know, imagine <laughs> 20 years ago, tell people they're yeah. going to have like fake butts, but you know, it, 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 <laughs> the BBL. <laughs> Totally makes sense because yeah. you know, at breast implants weren't a thing at one point, and then they were, and then so I, you know you can't say everything anything about a butt it, yeah. implant if you have breast implants. So it's like, oh yeah, okay, like just everything fashion, yeah, like physique fashion changes, and I think we did talk about that last time. So um, keeping that in mind, and then the other thing which I've been told, you know, as a judge and as a competitor, is that if you pick the top five and they all look the same, you're basically alienating everybody else mm. so therefore you win first second third fourth fifth you they will actually def, um, deliberately pick a different looking physique knowing that everyone who's either competing or watching will relate to one of those five physiques so they feel like they do have a chance so that's a like a marketing strategy of the actual that's physique. very interesting because i was just it, i went to the ifbb on the weekend you know i was, yeah. I was sort of alluded to before and um yeah, it's, it's interesting because you mm. have to go, well, ideally, based on the category, you should stick to the criteria of what you, you're you putting down and what you're saying, hey, this is what we're looking for. Because you can't, there was a point where it could have gone another way. And I was like, if that goes that way, that's politics because that is not what this category is about. Mm. There was a clear, defined person who was just like, that is that is classic physique. Yeah, that is exactly what we entail. That's exactly what you put. Anyway, 
what I was surprised about is, and I always go, well, I'm a smaller guy. So I'm like, I, I'm never going to be the biggest guy in the room. So I have to go for the, the most symmetry I can genetically and conditioning. That's yeah. literally it. Posing, presentation, that's it. I think you're right. It, like you said, everything's a trend. The size was definitely a, um, mm -hmm. a thing. But I always say to um, fellow athletes and competitors, I said, look, people have eyes. So like you can't deny what the eye sees, even if it's an illusion and it is an illusion because mm. making yourself look bigger is all about posing. But the yeah. biggest thing you can do to make yourself look bigger apart from posing is conditioning. Yeah. And if you condition right and you get ready early and then you reverse and you bring those carbs, because people always go, it's peak week. And I'm like, peak week means fuck all if you're not shredded. <laughs> like it does yes. nothing. And the thing is, <laughs> ideally you want to be ready beforehand because you want to have time up your sleeve. Mm -hmm. You want to de-stress the body. You want to reintroduce carbohydrate in a, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a way that is um, advantageous of not adding body fat. And you just, you know, you blow that physique out. And then if you're on stage, it's undeniable. If you mm. are clearly more, like shredded than anyone else and like you said shredded glutes is like the standard now i was surprised on the weekend how little shredded glutes i saw i only saw the odd one and i was like oh and i know it wasn't like pro league ifbb yeah. but i was like shit like you know i was like fuck like you know, because again i always go back to nathan wallace the, the guys that hold your own were great you know i trained with brandon kemp Dar, zach and a lot of those guys became natural mr olympia but one of the things that they are always renowned for is the conditioning of the athletes. And I didn't realize this until back in 2016, I went to a show and they all turned up. And again, this is where they didn't, they didn't have the best genetically gifted athletes, but all the athletes had the right protocols and they were, it's very simple, it was executed well, the tam, the posing, the conditioning. And I was like, oh my God. And it was almost embarrassing sometimes for the competitors because these guys were so much more conditioned. I'm not a judge at that point. I'd been to a handful of bodybuilding shows and even I was like, wow that is day and night like i can see all of your feathering i can see your anatomy yeah and it was like cool because obviously people like ourselves we like that it was awesome but i was just like wow that's amazing how like again if you do the work dedication you understand the protocols of nutrition you can get yourself that lean i would use i don't know if you know brian whittaker but brian whittaker lovely guy very humble same thing name's familiar he's in america he has two twins he's in his 40s and um not the biggest about five seven but his, he's renowned for his conditioning. So like, for example, you're like Doug Miller, right? Doug Miller, natural, genetic, massive, huge dude. But you look at Brian Whittake, half the size. Oh my, like, I'll show you a picture after. You have to see it to believe it. Like it's, it's what the, the suffering he goes through to get to that point. Cause you know, like getting that lean, it, but it's just, it's freaky. It's like, wow. Like I didn't even know you could get that lean. Yeah. You can see everything. And, and so when he's on stage, you're like, well, Oh, come on. Like, <laughs> that's going to be hard to beat, especially if you've got some half decent, you know, symmetry. And, yeah, and you're not like totally flat with that particular conditioning and, mm. and everything. But correct. I think that's a key. To, yeah, not yeah. being flat with it because you can look stringy. Yeah. And then, and then exactly. you kind of look like an endurance athlete, especially as a natural. So you need to make sure you're filling up. Or, you know, you've, you've got enough carb, carbohydrate and glycogen. And, and that's where it all does come down to the science. And, you know, I can see that you're passionate about that. And that always yeah. was the part that interested me. Because mm. it was, to me, it was about getting as absolutely lean as you possibly could, but maintaining the muscle mass. Yes, And then showing it off to the best degree. Because, you know, no point in, to me, if you were totally shredded, but you were, you know, you ended up flat and stringy and all of those things. However... Even with that, I would see that win at comps, mm, <laughs> you know, yeah. because sometimes it's it's like, it's just simpler. Oh, most shredded, boom. And, you know, you can ignore everything else. So it really, it does come down to the comp, the different, you know, who the judges are, who else is on stage and, and that sort of stuff. So it, 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 that's why you can't get disheartened because you have mm. to look at the long game. It's not like one comp is one comp, but like, what is your career? What is the end point of it? Sometimes you just need to be there and I hate to say this, paying your dues mm -hmm. um, time and time again consistently because what they do like to see also is that you bring you, you're not going from, okay, today I'm big and I'm smooth and then next comp I'm going to be kind of shredded and big and then the next one I'm going to be smooth. Like they want to see you being whatever your style is and, for example, you know, for you if it's shape and conditioning, they want to see you bring that and get that better every single time. Mm -hmm. So you, you're almost like competing against yourself within the lineup of who's at each show. So that's the thing to always keep in mind if you do ever get disheartened is it's like don't try to become the other competitor. Correct. Do yourself, you know, be you, be you, come back, and then you'll either get to a point where you'll know that your look 
even improving is not what they're looking for. And, mm. and that's where I guess people kind of decide, am I going to keep on doing this? Um, you know, some, for some people it does. It, it creates new clients for them, does other things for their business just to be on stage and have that kind of publicity. Other people, it's just that they love the process. So yeah. everyone has a different reason for doing it. it. You know, it may be that just qualifying for that Olympia because, you know, you're going to have 13 to 18 people in that. So there's mm. only ever going to be one winner. There's only ever going to be, you know, five people who make the top five and requalify. Um, so, you know, if it's your goal just to be in that show every single year and that becomes your career. So it, it's like same thing again, you know, where it's a solo sport. But mm. if you look at basketball, each team has a, a sort of a star, but there's, you know, more than you know, there's five players on the court. And I don't know how many who actually are in the team that cycle around and be, you know, the bench players and whatnot. But in the whole league, you know, there's a hun couple hundred players and there's, you know, a handful of people that mm. most people, if you talk to them, know who they are. They're not going to know the, you know, the bench, number one bench on some team that's not actually making it into the finals. And yet mm. that person's a freaking millionaire and incredible athlete, but, that's remembering as well that just because you're not winning the show doesn't take away the, from the legitimacy of what you're doing and what you're presenting. And I think that's mm. the other thing to remember as well that, um, you know, whilst we all want to be the number one at something, it's also having that mindset that there's room for more than one great mm. person. This is a, well, this is a salient point because I was speaking to Joseph who won at the weekend and one of the reasons I wanted to try and connect with him and I happened to see him outside is he said, I love the fact that you were yourself, you were unique and you weren't trying to be anyone. Because at the minute in physique sports, everyone's trying to be Chris Bumstead. And <laughs> it's like to the point where it's, it's, it's really quite now funny. It's, it's, it's embarrassing, I feel, well, because he... people get the mustache, the hair, and I'm like... You're not Chris Bumstead. One, he's genetically <laughs> fucking gifted. But also, be original. Be yourself. Be the yeah. next person who people want to be like. That, but don't do it for that reason. Do it to be you. That That is 100%. Like, that's just a, a crossing across everything uh, right now because I'm listening to a lot of different things around business and what I'm not. And it's all like, okay, here's the formula of how you do it. And I'm just like, really? Yeah. Like, how can I break this? How can I not do this? Because I just, I, I guess I'm mm. one of those people who doesn't like to necessarily follow the formula, as you can tell from, you know, back in early 2000 or late 90s when women weren't muscular. And people would say, why why do you want to do this? Why, why do you want to have muscle? Well, I like it. Mm. Now it's trendy for women to have muscle. But well, I actually want to dash it. Well, I mean, let's maybe like digress, that. digress into that <laughs> which is i think we were up to when you were started i don't know if we talked about like when you first became professional but i'd love to talk about that but also how women and other people reacted responded and treated you because of the size and the conditioning you were because it is very different to what most people expect yeah you know it's like for example it, i would say if i heads to in tattoos tomorrow people would just treat me differently mm. and now it, it's wrong but People just look and go, they make an, and they, you know, you make an it, assumption, right? It's, it's hard. You shouldn't judge, but your body, your mind formulates an opinion, especially if you're out of the norm. <laughs> so I would just love to hear a little so, bit more about that. Well, it's, I mean, it's actually a really, really interesting thing because as, as you say, tattoos is a really good um, comparison because you can't take it off. Like mm. it, pretty much a lot of other things that people can do. They can hide it, you know, when they go out in public because, you know, you can dress differently. You can, you know, look more conservative if you're not, you can take, if you've got piercings and you can take them out. They like can change what you want to do, but you can't hide muscle. Mm. I actually laugh because, you know, my friend Brandon Ray, he always is so big that he'll wear something and people will comment. He'll like, how could they tell I was covered up? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> You can't cover up. <laughs> but it, you can't you, cover you, up something that do big. Know, do you know what's like, ironic as well, though, it, with... Um, with big bodybuilders they often i think there's the opposite body dysmorphia they oh. don't realize how big they are no they don't and there's a, 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 a was a, just a sorry quick digression i was in new zealand massive massive bodybuilder in the gym he used to train late as he could and i saw him take his top off once like he had a string on and i come out back and he was almost like a little frightened puppy and he was like oh, oh so, sorry he like, apologized i was like what are you saying sorry for i'm like dude that's 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 unbelievable and he was like oh i uh, just you know and i'm like dude you, you're you're a mountain this is amazing but it was almost like he felt uncomfortable with being so big and he hated the attention which i just found to be i'm not saying that it, you should love it but i'm like dude you're like seven foot tall and three foot wide. Like <laughs> people are gonna. It doesn't matter what you are, brother. People are gonna know. <laughs> it's a, it's a it's an interesting thing because um, I know people who are tall mm -hmm. who a lot of people are scared of them. 
Mm. And they actually say that it's uh, not a nice feeling when you can sense people's fear of you. Correct. So I can, I guess if you're big and a muscular and that, you know, same thing, you know, for people say things like, oh, hope he doesn't beat me up or hope she doesn't beat me up and stuff. So you know that that's like their automatic reaction is like, oh, crap, I'm in trouble here if, you know, if they decide to be aggressive with me. And of course, females with muscle and aggression is somehow synonymous um, for a lot of people um, in their mind. Um, yeah. You know, anyone who knows me knows that. No, not at all. <laughs> but, uh, but but just coming back to um, my whole weight training journey and when I first started to to get bigger and weight train and everything, it, it, it goes through some phases. When I was what I would consider, you know, maybe you look at me and say, does she do some kind of sport? You wouldn't automatically have said, oh, she weight trains. Yeah, it was more like you're athletic. Athletic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was at that point when I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm trying to get bigger. I want to compete that, you know, I was like, at university at that point and people would be particularly like well you know why why you don't want ugly muscle and that that whole synonymy of like oh muscle is ugly on a female at that and this is you know early 90s i was gonna say it's trans again trends, trends exactly again. Yep. exactly and i even remember a friend of mine from uni there was a an article in a, like cleo or cosmo or something about like how, how to dress to hide your unsightly muscular thighs and she actually gave me that article <laughs> of like, Jesus. okay, like don't wear a skirt here because it's going to show that muscle there. Now it's kind of like, okay, let's wear that skirt up here. And I was going to say, now it's off. like show as much <laughs> as you can, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but Go that's, on. you know, that's like 20, 20 odd years ago. Yeah, no, fair So when I was a lot smaller, a lot of people tried to talk me out of it. Then what I found, particularly in Australia, as success came, it became acceptable. Wow. So, and, and even everything from my nutrition I would be eating a specific diet. People would be like, oh, come on, try to have this. Why are you doing that? No, I'm getting ready for a competition and they'd leave you alone. A friend of mine would eat vegetarian or I think she may have been vegan at the time and mm -hmm. people were like, oh, you know, have some meat. Come on, come on. Just because it was her personal choice, people wouldn't leave her alone yeah, about it. Where if she wouldn't Whereas, have said anything. And it just happened to, if people didn't pay attention, no one would have said anything. But because oh, she labelled it. No, 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 oh, no. Really? As in, no, that's just people observing. Oh, how oh, come you don't oh, eat that? Right trying to get her to convince her to eat meat <laughs> and yeah but she, she didn't have a valid enough reason other yeah, than i just right. don't want to eat meat so people would not let her alone I see. she just told them that she would compete as well exactly <laughs> i'm competing in <laughs> vegan competitions and i'm <laughs> whereas yeah Definitely. i would have a, a sporting reason and people straight away then they'd be like oh so what do you need to eat ah, people have a interested. curiosity about it at that yeah. point so that was a really in di different or an interesting psychology that I noticed that if you have a legitimate reason for doing something, people are curious. Mm. If it's just a personal reason, people find that like, that's almost like a red flag is I'm going to make you fall off of this. I'm going to, I'm going to get you to, to, yeah. to cave in and, and eat this, this bad food that you don't want to, that you don't want to eat, but I'm going to convince you that you want to eat it. Mm. Then, but yeah, as I, um, as I got bigger and I guess I kind of got more noticeably muscular and stuff people would say like oh you know what what do you do like what what you know what's with that and if i when i had won some world comp, you know world championships i'd be like oh you know i've won a world competition people is like it's totally fine oh my god that's amazing like people are, are happy for success if i it, but before i had that when i was so there was a period of time when i was you know very big competing and not really getting that success because i was too big that was when i was with ifbb before i switched over back in my uh, amateur career to get my world titles and, and all that sort of stuff. Then as soon as I had that world title, it was acceptable before that. If I'd say I compete and they'd like people, the first thing they ask is, oh, how do you do? Oh, well, I didn't actually win. I was, you know, voted being like, I was judged too muscular. Like, and then people are kind of like, oh, oh okay, yeah. Well, maybe you shouldn't be so big. Mm. As soon as you're like, oh no, I've won Miss World. I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. Oh, well done. Like, and this is just people at the supermarket checkout, yeah. you know, just random people around the place. So it was like, as soon as there was a success or something attached to it, it, w it was totally, totally okay. Yeah, it must have diffused the situation. Yeah, however, it is very um, location-based. So we mm -hmm. were in Melbourne at the time and, um, you know, Melbourne's pretty... Cosmopolitan. Yeah, pretty cos. Yeah. So, you know, I would walk into the city and wear, you know, leggings and whatnot. And people just kind of got to know you. Is this like when you were there for, for competition or just there I for live, When I lived there. Oh, I, right, I used to right. live in Melbourne. Right, yeah. So I was, I was in Melbourne mm. uh, until like early 2000s. So okay, I got right. my two of my three world championships. I was living in Melbourne. Right, okay. Um, yeah, training around there. So we literally would like walk from Richmond into the city as cardio on the weekend. Nice. So people kind of see you all the time and just... 
know you. And then um, I did a um, Big Brother ad. So Energizer Battery sponsored the Big Brother series. Oh, yeah, Big Brother, like the TV show. Yeah, the TV right, show. And I, this, was, this would have been, I don't know, like 2001 or two or something like that. And I got approached to be in the in the commercial. They had like six, six different commercials running. They were quite different. But my thing was like, you know, what – what big brother needs is a big sister and they kind of like panned out and I was flexing. So I was like, big sister. Fair enough. And, and uh, that was crazy because the amount of recognition that we got from that was like, you would, you go to a coffee shop, people had seen the ad, you walk down the street, people are saying, oh, you're the big brother girl, <laughs> you're big sister. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that, and, and people were totally okay with it. In yeah. fact, people were, were like, oh my God, oh my God. Like I remember one guy in, um, in a record shop, he'd met like two of the other people in the commercials. I see. So he'd like recognize these people. He's like, oh my God, I've met three people from the Energizer commercials. Yeah. And oh, you're my favorite and all that. So, so yeah, people were very, very accepting of it. Then I moved to Queensland. And um, yeah, you could, you could tell it was a different thing. <laughs> people were like, what the hell is this? And you would, I mean, I mean, I've only been there 10 years, but I would have thought, but that I'm basing it on now where, in Queensland, like you walk around in Melbourne, you don't see the amount of fit people you see here. They're there. Yeah. And then I zoom out again, and then you go to American Europe, and then they're even, they are there. They're in bigger quantities, but because there's more people, we actually, I realized how fit the Gold Coast was when I actually was in Europe. Because I was like, people were coming up to me like, oh my God, like they thought, I mean, and I'm not anything special, you know, in that regard, like big or anything, but people were just so obsessed. And I was like, what? Because there were so few and far between, but I'm like, ah, it's all about fitness in the goal. It's so fitness centric mm. at the is, minute. But this is going back again twenty years. I was going to say, it's different and a bit it like wasn't that. so much. Like Gold Coast has always been, you know, I guess you know, plastic surgery and blonde hair and a lot of those kind of things. Because that uh, I did notice. That I did notice moving <laughs> up from Melbourne. <laughs> Whoa! How are you doing? <laughs> you look constantly surprised. <laughs> Even the hairdresser said, like, I'm like, she's like, oh, this is the first, like, unbleached hair I've seen in, like, three years. Jesus Christ, <laughs> like, that's not good. Okay. <laughs> uh, you're like, really? This is she's just, like, oh, my God, normal. it's so healthy. I've not seen this for a while. What is this? <laughs> that's great. <laughs> but this is, yeah, this is going back a long time. But, no, the people generally weren't that fit up in Queensland back then. There you go. Just the average punter around about the place. And they, you know, people would stare, point comment like it was like you know it was not people positive are, like people it was are not in... subtle though are they which is which no. strikes me strange like people really just stare <laughs> like i would feel bad staring at someone i just wouldn't yeah, they do would it. point and stare oh really? my god look at that look at her you should turn around <laughs> <the way. laughs> no I, well, I, I was with my husband then and he there was a lot of stuff that he would say back to them oh yeah, yeah i was gonna say and stuff Back yeah, well, because you stop but, nice. You don't. Yeah. It's a bit rude, isn't it? it, it I mean, the it, best it, thing is to come and talk to the individual if you're curious and interested. Yeah. It it didn't worry me because because again, I was like, I'd look at them and I'm like, well, I don't yeah. want to look like you. I'm quite happy looking how I look, so fine. Yeah, you know, and I accepted that I'm a curiosity because, like, obviously on stage, you're there to be judged for physique and mm. stuff, and you're not going to go and look at just any person. You know, you put ten people up on stage. Mm. No, yeah, not it's good, interesting at it's all. Good that you had but... that though, because I think a lot of people get like like I was saying before, when you don't necessarily have to like the um, uh, the exposure that you get or the attention, but to to get to a point and be confused about why you get it when you are someone who is at a high level who is it, clearly bigger than a lot of people and then turn around to go i don't know i, I don't know it, why people it's like well hang on a minute yeah. it's like walking around with a car shaped as a penis someone gonna you know people no but like why, people, why are people, people are gonna commenting? go and then and then people and they go i don't know why everyone's bloody looking at me all the time taking pictures of my car but like it's it's pretty out there yeah. man like you know but and, like and it's that's, good that's, that you had that personality yeah because it's like and you just I, nonchalant just, about it because yeah. i think that's key because then otherwise, because you could have been angered by it, but then it would have been like you were fueling your own anger. It's yeah, like, well, like ah, I, I go, go and train really hard to look like this to then be bothered that people notice that I look different to the average person. So bang. Yeah. Exactly. No. So like, that's I mean, I, I you know, could, could have cared less. What's like, the, like, do you have any specific interactions that are quite comical that you remember and go, oh, that was a belter. Like someone coming up to you and be like, do you play tennis? Like, you know what I mean? Someone coming up and just being really weird or strange or just going, that, that was, that was different. Oh gosh. I can't think of anything specific. I mean, you, obviously you when not, you go but... to comps and stuff, like a dude, when we went to the Olympia one time and this was before I was professional walking around, I do remember the guy who 
threw himself on the floor, grabbed my calf, Jeez. said he wanted to make a plaster mold of it. <laughs> nice. That's <laughs> all he, in at the minute. <laughs> and, and, could he, and could he, like, if he, if he could, like, just put his hands on it, he'd be able to, like, get the, the general size of this plaster mold. Jesus. And kind of, like, like, try to extract, you know, pull my foot away, like, because this was, like, this was embarrassing at the Olympia to have some person, like, throwing themselves on the floor or grabbing my calf. Even amongst all bodybuilders, I was I was embarrassed. Oh, my calf. My yeah. calf. Get off, get yeah, off. there you are. Do it's about, that. look, really? it's going to cost you 10 grand, <laughs> but you need to get up off the floor there, buddy. All right? <laughs> if I hadn't known more about monetization. Yeah, well, that's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, there you yeah, go. So compliment that, that, then. Well, strange, but nonetheless that a compliment. Was a weird, that was a weird interaction. Maybe he had a have... calf fetish. Oh, yes. Uh, like 100% he had a calf <laughs> fetish. <laughs> Could have been a foot fetish. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It does go hand in hand, unfortunately. <laughs> so, <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> but yeah, that that was a strange interaction. Like to uh, have someone is, that yeah. that kind of like physically demonstrative yeah. at somewhere like the Olympia. Were you, um, because when you said yeah, like you were competing at the Olympia as well. So were you like covered uh, in tan and he was doing? Oh this? no, no, that was before I was professional. So I oh, was just, right. I guess, a guest. So I was oh, right, so. off season, but not you know out of shape off season mm. or anything. Just kind of cruising around. Being part of the industry, that would have been, you know, like 99 or 2000 mm. or something like that. So, um, and and again, you know, because I wasn't professional, I wasn't expecting to get that type of attention. Yeah, like right. I was still a, a NABA amateur competitor. Yes. Didn't, and again, I I knew I stood out, but again, I'm at the Olympia, so I'm not expecting that. Yeah, you're like, the uh, attention's on these guys. Yeah, all, all, all females and everything, because, you know, that's where, that's when, gosh, she would have still been competing back then. Um, Iris wasn't at her peak. She was still kind of placing a little bit low back then, but that yeah. era, um, I think Linda Murray had actually come back. Yes. Um, so that, you know, there was some, you know, Yakshani or, or Klein, I'd never say her name. Yeah. Some big women and, and, you know, much more famous women than myself. So mm. yeah, I was like, okay, this, these Americans are weird. What's yeah. going on? But, and they're, but so, they're very out there and they're very full. So mm. when, when did, when did you turn pro and then like maybe lead us up to the Olympics? So we're speaking oh. to John Davey uh, in between one of our podcasts and he was telling me about his Olympia experience, you know, just, just the presence of going to that show. Yeah. Oh, it's a, it's a long time span. It's a very yeah. long time span. Cause just in give my, us the, in give my, us the, I'll, I'll give you the, the sequence. So I started competing in mm. 91 mm -hmm. as an under 52 competitor. Mm -hmm. So like very tiny, IFBB, um, did a, a couple of shows, went to uni and decided, you know, okay, I need to just put this on pause for a little bit, focus on uni. But then I met a, a, a guy who I was training with who competed NABBA and he's like, oh no, come to NABBA. You know, you should do NABBA. So, okay, I'll do NABBA. You know, to me at that point, much really, of a yeah, much of a muchness. So I did a, a couple of shows there um, and got exposed to, I guess, to, to like how the women were, because the NABBA women were bigger than the IFBB women, mm. uh, even back then. So I was like, Ooh, okay, well, yeah, this is, this is some, something to aspire to. Um, then, um, later, like just as I was finishing uni, I went back to IFBB cause I was like, Oh no, I need, I want to get a pro card. So I do need to go to IFBB, mm. uh, you know, do Southern States comp. And I think at that point, um, that was like my first show where I kind of started to make a little bit of noise because I had I'd, I'd been just like a nobody competitor and then I got condition mm. like I showed up I had condition I had muscularity people were like oh shape's not too bad yeah who's this um mm. yeah and you know easy wins for me um but you know I did the show shut it down so I had still one more year of uni to go come back and then I did the Australasias and that was the that was a show where I started to create a little bit of controversy because my physique stood out way too much and I got placed third and that was where I got this whole explanation of um, here's ideal and we judge off of ideal and you're like here away from ideal. You're not like, so if this is below ideal and above ideal, mm. you're too far above. So you have to be like closer to ideal. Is this when and, the categories were still like there was only so many or was this starting to be more? Because I think we talked about last time in other words, they've, they've expanded over the years. Yeah, just I to think, give it I think at that stage they had introduced body shaping, which doesn't exist anymore. But essentially Australia did their own thing and created body shaping whilst the rest of the world was creating figure. Right. So we ran for a couple of years with this thing called body shaping, which was actually, no, sorry, before figure there was fitness. Yeah. So there was like literally the option was you had to be an amazing gymnast or a bodybuilder. And I then see. and Australia went, 
yeah, we're not so great at gymnastics. Like, because yeah. America, you know, you, they yeah. do that through school and stuff. So they created what is now figure, but it had its own name. So literally, I'd already started competing. And when... this was before physique, then. Way, way. So, oh, so I was oh, going to say, like, oh, figure was physique. the most muscular one for the longest time. No. Uh... As in before you could get to physique. Um, yeah, but, but then bodybuilding's they, always been the most muscular. Right, yeah, so, so I mean, body, yeah, so, so bodybuilding's the, the, the ultimate, most yeah, muscular one. one. Physique, I mean, gosh, that was like 2013 or 14 or okay, something. That's yeah. relatively new. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. Um, and has changed a lot in the time since it came out. But yeah. so in, in IFBB worldwide, let's forget Australia, there was always mm. bodybuilding. Then they introduced, uh, the, the... Figure? No, no, not figure. Oh, uh, um, fitness. fitness, which yep. was which was the you know the gymnastics component, which still exists today. They have a body round, the gymnastics round, and something else I can't mm -hmm. remember now. Then they brought figure in, yes. and that was really for the extreme of not muscular. Like you know, they were not supposed to have cups in their hamstrings. Yeah. It's like in it, between. It's meant to be right because uh, now it's like what bikini, fitness, figure, bodybuilding. And wellness. And, oh, that's right. <laughs> and wellness. So, yeah, so, so <laughs> it, it went one. for many years with just figure and bodybuilding. So figure being, I would call them the T-shaped girls. Yes. Bodybuilding the X-shaped girls. Correct. <laughs> Broad shoulders, no legs. But even though they would have legs, but they, you know, posed in a such a way. They don't have a posing routine. They wear high heels. Went along like that. Then, yeah, then they introduced physique, mm -hmm. which was the, for the, I call them the structurally small girls. Because mm. bodybuilding, you've got to have a big structure. Mm. And the same girl with a small structure will not compete. She mm. cannot compete. She can be as muscular, but it's it just looks different when it's on a, a slighter frame. Mm -hmm. In between that period, they did break the bodybuilding into weight classes for a period of time, which was when I was competing in the early mm -hmm. 2000. Um, then... You know, who, who was running the IFBB kind of got thrown out. Mannion took over and then he turned it into a real business. So that's how that all kind of incorporated and yeah. changed. Oh, but yeah, yeah, physique came in, uh, which as I said, it was, well, it was originally meant to be a little bit more downplayed as well. Cause that's when Dar Darnalyn Bailey was the first Miss Olympia physique and she had those like square quads and not a pretty muscle shape, but she was kind of looked raw a bit. size. Yeah, she kind of, she looked a but not aesthetic. Not aesthetic, yeah. Okay. So she was the girl next door that, you know, pretty much you could kind of jump up and have a little bit of muscle and, oh, yeah, and that. Cool. And she sense. was a small girl. Makes sense. It's now developed into something totally different oh, yeah. over that seven-year period. And then, of course, wellness has come in, which is all – sorry, bikini came in before physique, I think, yeah. which was all the, um, again, like b bikini shape. You had to obviously have a bikini body. Um, you know, it was kind of more about – breasts and boobs and yeah yeah and, and it's it's Very, quite funny it's not much conditioning no and not to take i mean i it, don't want to disrespect those because i think at the higher level a, i get it but it's a very it's, it's an genetic, easy physique to but attain. it's a very genetic physique as well it is because but i just don't think there's much kind of work that needs i mean because i think like you need the boobs and you know what i mean like yeah you need to be lean enough but it's like yeah you gotta have the small it's, waist and it's, it's yeah it's a lot of genetics and and there's a lot of controversy over like yeah. you know what is considered bikini because it's and then you got wellness now, which is just confused. I'm, I'm well, confused. Honestly, well, wellness time. is um, just, geez, like it's again, it's it's so genetic because you've got to have a massive, small waist, you've got to have a big butt, massive ass, yeah. Um, you Tiny know, waist. I'm like, what the fuck? They, does an implant count? Um, <sighs> you know, like you can see on some of the girls, like the scar marks where they've had the implant. And so it's, it's just like, you look at the where. So, I mean, there are a few individuals who have glutes that sit that high, but I'm yeah, like, but, oh, that is that didn't just it, look, someone just stuck it on. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that's where it's it's open to to a lot of that happening. You know, yeah. implant side of things because literally they don't they don't have broad shoulders. Mm. Um, so it is a specific, you know, maybe mm. more South American type of physique, or certain women do have those type of physiques, but not the average woman. Exactly. So it, it is again, it's a very genetic category. Yeah. But having said that, so is bodybuilding because you've got to have the you know the structure, the insertions, Correct. the ability to build muscle. So they've segmented it down, and the same with the men. So that literally any person in the population could fit into either bikini or figure or physique Correct. or wellness or bodybuilding. So there's a greater chance that anyone can go and find the category that suits them, which is like, okay, fair enough. That was a mm. very smart business move from their point of view because, you know, if I'm a, a smaller structured girl and I want to train and have muscle, but I can never compete in, you know, in fairness against the bigger girls because they're just going to dwarf me. Mm. Now I have a place where I can go and compete. You know, if I'm... If I tend to grow big shoulders, but I'm a bit 
I'm a bit straight up and down. Um, you know, I can go do figure and <laughs> and, and down. <laughs> so just fucking class. Yeah, no, but, that's good. That's or if good. I'm great at gymnastics and and I and I train because the body of a, of the um of the fitness girls is very functional. Mm. You know, a lot of what how they look is because of how they train. You know, mm. they they kind of got like the thicker waist because they're having to do all of those dynamic explosive mm. movements and everything. So that every part of their body is very, very functional, but they don't have the best looking bodies. Like, mm. you know, it's, you know, you get the odd one that does, but majority of them are, you know, a little bit, you know, they can't stand in any one of the other categories and, and hold it, hold their own basically. So mm. yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any more that they could break it out, <laughs> but I could be wrong. Yeah. You know, they'll, they'll find something that some we've missed somewhere along the line, but that's, pretty much the history of it but back in those days like back when i was doing my um the amateur side of things was still in australia it was still just bodybuilding and i think we had some weight classes so we had like lightweight which was under 52 then 52 to 57 or something and then over 57 kilos um and then you know they had this body shaping and, and a bit of fitness but you know anyone who went to comps back in those days if you had two or three girls in fitness you were doing well um, body shaping was pretty popular and then that did become figure and that was you know always pretty popular mm-hmm. um but yeah that that f- the australasias yeah that was the first time where yeah uh, the things that coincided were iron man magazine launched so i got featured and written up for being you know outstanding but not placing and of course australia has a history for politics in you know in bodybuilding so <laughs> i guess the whole bodybuilding has a history of politics mm. um but that you know in, in one way that kind of made me be noticed and got a lot of fans from doing that but it didn't really get me anywhere like i didn't get a pro card out of it mm. there was no mechanism for getting a pro card um so i did that went back and did the australia's they told me to get softer because you know this is when i didn't know any better and they were like oh you're too lean it's not fair to the other girls for you to be that lean. Okay, sorry, I won't work so hard. So I did. I come in softer, but I I went from like I don't know fifty six kilos to seventy two. Jesus. And I was like five foot three, and they were like, "Oh crap, now you're too big," and I'm like, "But you said get softer," and that because they had done that, and a lot of the people it was in Sydney, both of the comps, and a lot of people who were in Sydney were in Sydney again, and they're like, "Hey, but you told her to get softer." <laughs> And it, it, it did, it turned into this kind of massive mm. thing, um, which a lot of people sort of still remember um, who are you know, my age in bodybuilding. But they gave me this top title of Australia's Most Muscular Woman. Didn't, you know, I was taken off the judging sheet. I wasn't even judged. I didn't even place Jesus. in that comp. But that was kind of when I realised that, you know, people, there were hardcore fans out there who respected the work and respected, like, what I'd done and that I had actually also tried to kind of do what they said which was, you know, tone it off a little bit. But, yeah, when you have that much muscle and you don't diet down that hard, you what bigger. happens, you're bigger. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and again, no pro card. It yeah. was just like, oh, sorry, nothing we can do about that. Uh, maybe go do the natural worlds and, you know, maybe, you know, something of that. Or they also told me that I had to put an application in for a pro card, which is a load of crap. Like, you don't put an application in. They just basically say, we nominate this person. Yep, tick, have a pro card. Exactly. So that was all that. And then I... So I went, okay, we'll go another way around. I'll do NABBA, just fun, travel, see what happens. Um, they like the big girls. And that was when I really started to kind of develop my physique up, um, compete internationally, really kind of understand, you know, the I guess the relationship with the training and where I wanted to go and just have some fun with it, you know, because that at that point I was like the pro card had gone out of my mind. It wasn't going to happen. There wasn't a mechanism in Australia to get that, but I, I just liked my physique and mm. I just liked training and seeing what I could do with it and push it. And then it was fun. Um, you know, we went to Spain, we went to um, Athens, you know, Greece, we'd been to Austria, went to Vienna to compete. That was actually quite interesting. That was um, – yeah, beautiful city, beautiful, beautiful city. Vienna's, yeah. yeah, but just the, again, the reaction to muscle there was kind of like, oh boy. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they weren't sure about it at all. <laughs> So, um, but, but yeah, again, it was, it was, a, it was a fun, um, time, you know, a lot of the, the and travel too. So yeah. The nice. travel, the travel with, um, you know, with competing and just meeting different people and, um, you know, people that 
you know, even now, like you sort of loosely keep in contact with yeah, them. Yeah. Connecting with like-minded people around the world is, yeah. always, is always pretty fun. Yeah. So, and, and, you know, just the memories from that and the stuff that you kind of mm. can't take away from that. So that was all, um, you know, I went through that and I was just pretty much just going to probably keep on kind of competing. I didn't really have any um, direction around it. and But then obviously in the background, Tony Doherty was starting to run his ball, trying to start to run his first pro show. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, kind of saying, you're getting too popular and we want you in our federation. So that was how the whole pro card thing came about because he was like, you, you can't compete NABBA again. You've got to come back, do this show, and then we'll give you a pro card from that show. And this is show. IFBB. Yeah. yeah. Again, okay. Yeah. So it wasn't a, that was, he didn't have a pro qualifier for the women. There was a pro qualifier for the men. Mm-hmm. I don't think there was at that show, but it was his very first pro show in Melbourne in mm -hmm. 2001. Right, okay. Yeah, so we did it. I, it was, again, I think it was called the Southern States or something like that. Yeah. And he's like, just come and compete it and we'll get the pro card. Because as I say, you don't have to actually apply. You can just say, we want this girl to have a pro card. Yes. So um, that was where I actually got my pro card. So that was like March 2001. Right. Um, did that. So um, I'd done, must have been 2000, I had won NABBA Worlds again. And that's why I said to him, I was like, I'm not waiting a whole year to compete. Because he was first like, oh, you have to f mm. like do a sanction or something. And I was like, nah, forget it. Like, yeah. I'll just keep on competing. Like, I don't trust you enough to yeah, run, yeah, yeah. to take that deal. Exactly. Um, so we did. So then we did that. And then I think it was, I can't think how, it might have been July. We did the Jantana, which was the first pro show in 2001. Right. So I very quickly, you know, from getting the pro card, I was like, I'm already in shape. I'm just going to, I want to do the very first show that I possibly can. Yeah, of course. Um, wait, and and like get that under my belt it. and stuff. So, yeah. And that, again, by that time, you know, all the things that had happened was like, you know, internet was starting, people were getting access to you and stuff. So this is like before Facebook, before Instagram, you know, people just used to go on websites and email you and there was chat rooms and stuff like that. So the, the ability to kind of get your physique out there. Mm. Uh, and be seen so I had started to kind of you know build an international fan base from doing the um the NABBA stuff because a lot of that was shown on ESPN or at, like Europe and um just you know having a little website and putting photos up and all that stuff was um you know just building to that so that's why you know by the time I got to America and started to travel and go to go to the Olympia because at that point as I said I wasn't I hadn't got my pro car but I was competing internationally I had become known I was getting a lot of um contact from people and stuff so they'd seen my physique and that i guess kind of made it more interesting it's like who is this girl mm. this um that doesn't we we haven't seen her come up through the um amateur ranks in america she's kind of come out of nowhere and what's going on so mm. um yeah so that was that was like the first um foray into the pro ranks and as i said there was the three weight classes which played against me terribly um because i literally again got told you're too short for your weight I'm like, it's a problem because I can't grow. I'm like 30 something. Growing's ended. And they were like, you need to come down a weight class. You need to try to be like a middleweight. I'm like, oh God. Okay. But I did actually try. I tried. Um, didn't suit me because I have a big frame. They forget that. But I did it. I did increase my placings a little bit, but it nearly killed me. It wasn't, it wasn't fun. It wasn't what I wanted and wasn't what I enjoyed. Yeah. And that was when I retired the first time. Cause I was like, I'm not going to do well competing as a heavyweight. Mm -hmm. It's going to kill me to compete as a middleweight. So this is this is the time when it's not fun anymore. And then in between all of that, as I said, the guy who was running it, um, Wayne D'Amelio, he got kicked out. Jim Mannion took it on. They scrapped all of the um, weight classes. So by the time I came back to compete, there was you know weight classes were a thing of the past. And um, I also had alert from that because that about the consistency thing, mm -hmm. because the very first year that I went in, you know, super shredded, great condition, getting beat by people with floppy asses and stuff like that. And you're just like, how does this happen? Because in NABBA, it was very true. Like if you were on, you were on, you won. If you're off, you didn't win. You know, it, there wasn't a lot of politics from that point of view. Like it was pretty much best physique one. Then you go to America and you're be. just like, oh my God, they know what the call outs are before you even hit the stage. <sighs> So they, because they're like, oh, you're not even into like the third call out or something. And you're like, how do you know? Oh, that's what the running sheet says. So, so oh. you're kind of like, you re you're realizing how um, much politics is politics or contrived or just how it is, because it's, because it is like, um, we want to look after that person that's done the right thing and competed. And, you know, there's so, there's so much to it that's mm. kind of out of your control and being 
not from America. You don't even know who any of the judges are. You haven't come up through, you know, a million NPC shows mm. and that sort of stuff, which does make it hard because people are going, calling judges by first names. And I'm just like, what are they talking about? <laughs> I don't even know who they are. And I wouldn't even have known if I'd like tripped over the head judge or anything. But they, you know, Americans are way more politically savvy. So they kind of make a point of knowing mm. who people are and talk to the right person and say the right things and, and all that. And we're just like these Aussies that just kind of go along <laughs> do whatever um so yeah so that that was um yeah that you know the second year i came back i was like it was very mentally hard to put all of my all into it mm. and i didn't come in in my best condition and i kind of suffered a placing and even though it was a one placing it was that thing where if i had have brought what i had brought the year before i probably would have been two placings higher so it was that that thing and that learning where i didn't have the maturity at that point in time to accept that and acknowledge that it was just kind of like the frustration and anger mm. of having worked so hard for something and then to kind of see that it, that's how it actually played out. But then when I came back, you know, as a more mature person who'd seen it all happen before, same thing. I come in, I get like, you know, 11th place in my first show and I'm like, I didn't deserve that. But anyway, here I am. Next show, seventh. Okay, cool. I'm moving in the right direction. I know I just have to keep on bringing the same thing, same thing. So I just, just brought the same thing, like literally. And then the next year I qualified for the O. So that was literally... Like if it had been me the time before, I would have been like, I don't, you know, third, mm, eleven place. Mm. That's not fair. Like, how come all these girls mm. beat me? They they mm. look like nothing. Like honestly, the girl that won looked like a housewife. Yeah. But she'd been on a um a TV show about female bodybuilding or something, so she was kind of quite popular yeah. at the time. But literally, t I'm looking at her backstage, going, Did she diet? Does she train? Yeah. Like that's, that's that was good. the level that she was at, just from Jesus. a perspective of other comps where you're kind of like in awe of the people that you're competing against. Exactly. And there were some girls that were good, but this girl that won was not that girl. Fair enough. So as I said, I kind of just went, okay, yeah, we'll just take a breath, go back. We know what to do. You just know, play the game. Play the game. And even when other competitors are saying, oh, you're, you're coming too dry and too shredded, you need to back it off a bit. I'm like, yeah, no, I don't. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah you, you can do that. I'm not going to. This yeah. is my look. Just I'm Nod and it. smile. Yeah, e exactly. Because it's, right it's kind of like, you you know, I, I actually have been in this a long yeah. time. You're so. just doing this to get where you need to go, but you don't need to explain that to anyone. Yeah. You just need to do what you need to do. And, and even if I hadn't have gotten me where I wanted to go, I'm like, that's just, that's what I'm bringing. Like, that's yeah. me. I've learned from past mistakes yeah. to not necessarily do that. And that, But that's, that is the standard that I have for myself. And that's what I want to bring for myself. So, like I say, we just kind of, we just kept on mm -hmm. doing that. And, you know, it, whilst it didn't bring up, I did win the Toronto Pro um, finally, and that mm -hmm. was just the year after. But when I did the Olympia was literally the last time that it was held until they brought it back mm -hmm. now. So it was like the 50th for the men, but it was the, I don't know, whatever for the women. And it was the last actual um, show, but it was, it's like the Olympia is a different, um, it's a different vibe. Like, so then you, so you qualified. So how old are you now when I you am... come into the first Olympia show? Like, sorry, when, so, when yeah, you when, so... in the story, not now. But... I'm trying to think what year that was. It was 2014. Yeah. So I would have been coming. I was, I think I was like 41 at the time. So coming up for 42 or something. Right, so, yeah. Okay, so yeah. early forties. Yeah. Yeah. So did that, um, but, you know, same thing again. I was just out of the top 10. You look at it, you're like, nah, whatever, but yeah, hey. You got, it your, was, you got what you needed. <laughs> yeah, I, I was there. I can say that I was there. And I think this, mm. you know, from the perspective of Australian females, if you don't include Bev Francis because she didn't get her pro card to Australia, I don't think there's really been many, if any, other Aussie women who've done it. So mm. I'm like, hey, okay, that's that's pretty cool. And to say that you've done it, and as I said, it's a, um, it's a big grandiose affair like okay. you have the um you have the you know the meet the olympians and stuff like that which is really cool and um you know being aussie i did the um i had my photographs there i'm like don't gold coin donation because of course they don't have gold coins in america <laughs> so everyone's like what's a gold coin donation <laughs> And I'm like, it's tip me whatever you feel like. Yeah, like, just literally. give me whatever you want. And then and they do like 20 bucks for a photo. Like a lot of people take them for free. Yeah. But because Americans tip and I'm like, okay, yeah. Because they're like used to paying, you know, 15 bucks, 20 bucks. I'm just like, yeah, just give me whatever. Yeah. And stuff. So, and that was, yeah, that was cool to, um, to actually, you know, be at that event and, you know, be, be a part of all of that and you get all your official tracksuit and just, yeah, it, it has a totally different vibe. And that's again, part of you know, when I ended up retiring, which was the next year, because the, the Olympia for Women got replaced with the um, the Rising Phoenix. 
which was run right. by Wings of Strength. So I don't know if everyone knows, Wings of Strength no. have now bought <laughs> the Olympia. Oh, so oh, <laughs> I think they bought it like so just before COVID or during yeah. COVID or something, just been just before. So um, the guy who owns Wings of Strength, he's mm. a massive, massive supporter of female bodybuilding. Yeah. And he was determined to get female bodybuilding back into the Olympia. Mm. Um, they weren't having a bar of it. So he's like, okay, well, they sold it. He bought it. <laughs> No, he put, he put bodybuilding, women's bodybuilding back in. Yeah, nice. So um, he, yeah, like he owns the Olympia comp. Obviously not, he's not part of the NPC uh, people, but he, mm. like, it was always owned by a separate organization. Mm. So um, so that's how that came back in. But anyway, the, the, the show the next year, that was like the replacement for the Olympia. Mm. It was um, like, cause if the Olympia is kind of up there in that grandioseness, this was, it was so casual. It oh. was so just kind of familiar and I had suffered an injury coming into it and then doing that show, I was just like, nah, I think this is time to retire because it's just, it doesn't have that specialness about it. It just feels like any other show. In fact, it probably felt too familiar. Um, there was, yeah, it didn't feel like a big, this is not the pinnacle of what I do. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, injury, I'm like, ah, nah, body, body's telling me enough, like time to just kind of back it off and, and um, yeah, enjoy and not have to worry about you know, if I eat the wrong thing. Like, yeah, you yeah. were just only only I know. <laughs> and and that and that's kind of where you stopped competing. That was it. There's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and 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 that's what I mean. Like it was, it was. Yeah, there wasn't the incentive there. Like if, I think if it had have remained at the Olympia, um, potentially I would have gone. Okay, yep. Let's get some surgery done. Let's get back into this and let's keep on going and yeah. see how far we can go. But um, yeah, when when it's like the yeah the incentive was not what mm. it was. And I was like, okay, so I've done that. And I don't want to be that person that's like coming down the other end of the hill, just getting worse and worse yeah, and worse. And no. just like st still dragging myself to that comp. Cause I have seen that too many times yeah. in bodybuilding where it's a shame. yeah, people come back and you feel like you maybe should have let it go a couple of years ago and then finish people, on a high. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. Or, or your, or your own, your own high. Yeah. Your own Zenith. So that, yeah. so that Olympia show with the, when you did compete, when yep. it was the Olympia then. Um, did you meet any or, or make any specific friends with the other girls that were there competing? Was well, there anyone that you kind of connected with or not Not really? Um, for Not really. I mean, the thing is, it's the same girls that you've competed with, like, all the way through. So, obviously, okay. like... Oh, so there wasn't the different girls in the Olympia, no? No, because you... You were just judged differently. Yeah, like, mm. I mean, like, Yakshani, yeah, she was obviously pre-qualified, but I'd competed with her years back mm. so i already knew your chetty iris was probably the only person i'd kind of not really met met um and obviously she kind of keeps to herself a lot mm. backstage um alina popa who now is um kind of runs the olympia with jake um who owns it um I, again i i knew most of the people already so it wasn't kind of anything um extraordinary it, i think yeah. deb the Deb about I can't can't say her same surname either. So she was also top of the Olympia. I'd already met her years before we both did a photo shoot together. She was still amateur. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's a small community like the female mm. bodybuilders and stuff. So I'm just trying to think if there was anyone who I hadn't met that I did end up meeting that do I didn't. You, do you know. honestly think you should have placed higher at Olympia based on your physique versus theirs? Then with those oh, same. Yeah. Women? If if you're looking at pure physique, I mean, versus this is your physique, opinion as well. Yeah, just, my opinion. I'm interested. Of course, I'm yeah, interested. Yeah, I, I know it's subjective. <laughs> I, I probably should have been at like at least probably four places higher. I mm. would say, yeah. So like in the top three, top no, three, no, top I, five. I, I would say probably top six. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to put myself up that high because there's a mm. lot of like what else goes into the Olympia that one minute where you get to really present yourself mm. and some of the women who have been there like time after time, like the Debs, like the Yakshins. But were these women actually more muscular, more conditioned, more symmetrical than you? That you um, symmetrical in a, in a way, yes, because when I went back to compete as a, all like in my 30s, my shape was not what it was in my 20s. <laughs> I, yes. I'm, I'm the first to admit that, that the curvature had gone. Like when you're in your twenties, you have like a natural, much more natural pop mm -hmm. as you get older and your estrogen drops more. And you particularly as a white woman, like things flatten out. So mm. there wasn't the, the flow that I like, if I had have been able to take my physique from that first time around and then transplant it there, or if I had have kept going at that point and hadn't kind mm. of got disillusioned by it all, I would have had a better career. But yeah, coming back in my thirties, like, <clears throat> Some stuff was good, but then, like I say, my waist was blockier. 
you know, my glutes didn't develop up the same they were, but like there were flaws that I saw that, mm. you know, I couldn't change. You know, mm. my legs didn't have the, the flow that they had. They were still big, but they were kind of more, I would call them more like hardcore, heavy duty type of legs rather mm. than pretty mm. um, type of legs. So from that muscularity, yes, as muscular, but I think the way the whole package sat together, um, then, you know, there was things where pe other people presented better and were able to kind of present everything. But, um, you know, other people disagree. I got a lot of good feedback from yeah. people that were... That, that watched in, it in that, it's interesting because so. I feel, and this might be a difference between men and women, but I feel like, again, like going back to, I was talking about Frank Zane before, he felt like his physique was best in his late 40s. And I've seen that in a lot of athletes who, who have the continuum. Obviously, they've got the time in because if you just start training at 40, that's different. But it's yeah. almost like you just get that, you know, your skin thins, you get that muscular maturity, you just get that. It's like my dad now, he's 56, a fucker. And like, you know, but no, great shape, you know what I mean? And like, he looks leaner than me all the time. But he's not, but he's, he's in great shape. Yeah, he's yeah. always got his abs out sort of thing and he's lean, he's athletic. But he looks so much leaner because of he's trained a lot longer than me. And he... um. He's obviously well connected, but his skin is thinner, and I'm just like, and he's vascular, and you're just like, oh mate, like people just get, like he drives the, he drives his, um, the truck back and to from the airport. He, you know, works for East Coast, and he's 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 got amazing triceps. And he says, and people just like, because he picks up all the competitors, and they're like, what 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 are you doing? Like, what is it? Because you know, but he's trained that long, and he's yeah. consistent, and he does have fairly good genetics, but it's just like. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I, I would <laughs> definitely ridiculous. say that, like, the conditioning and the dryness and everything yeah. was a lot better. And, you know, probably the last year that I competed, it was the biggest, like, from thickness from my upper body point of view. But this is me judging against what my perfect aesthetic is yeah. and the things that I saw that changed that, that I had to me – like whilst, you know, maybe the condition wasn't as good back then, but if I could have that shape that I had – that are the, that is some of the things that I would you know mm. that I thought changed for me. The other thing, of course, costume style changed. Yeah, and you wore a lower costume, which when I was competing before, you wore a higher costume, which of course improved your shape. So there's yeah, all of those little things that added into it, which was I was kind of like, yeah, it, it was a different look. It was a more mature look. Some people would say it was better because it was you know drier or or looked harder and you know certain muscles were were bigger. But mm. from what I was looking for, it was the aesthetic wasn't where I wanted it to be. So the Understood. the muscularity was fine, the conditioning was fine, but the aesthetic had stepped away from where I actually wanted it to be. So mm. that but that you know that's me looking at it with my critical eyes of what I would like out of it. So, yeah, yeah, it's understandable. So I guess yeah. transitioning from that and now not competing in that realm. How, how would you frame your training now or your goals? And how, what was it like for you? Did you have any troubles going from like competing to then all of a sudden not? Yes. Only because you, yeah, you strike me as someone who's very competitive. And I feel like there's a bit of a gap there. So I'm just wondering maybe where your attention's focused now. Yeah. Well, there was, a, well, there's actually a massive gap because obviously I stopped competing, you know, probably that's coming up seven years ago. Mm. And the first year after that, as I said, I'd suffered an injury just coming into it. Yeah, which you I alluded had... to surgery, you said. Yeah, well, I, well, see, this is this is the thing. I did a little tear, then I did a big tear, like seven weeks out, little tear. What have you done couple specifically? Of weeks out. What is it? Um, and I, I can't remember. Is it labrum? In, in, infraspinatus. Oh, infraspinatus, yeah. And there's something else. So it's in the shoulder. Good in the hole. shoulder, yes. Yeah, yeah. Big hole. Um, <laughs> big, big hole. <laughs> big That's not good. That, that, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But at the time... Like I said, I, I didn't tell anyone. I went through to the show because I also had the philosophy that if you tell someone you're injured, they're straight away looking for something. Correct. If I don't tell anyone, I can see it, plain as day, the difference between my two delts, but nobody's ever said anything to me, so. <laughs> and we'll keep it strong. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's all that. doesn't matter now. Yeah. Um, and then when I got back from the comp, I, was, I had a guest pose at the Bendigo show. So I was training at Doherty's and I did a front raise and my bicep just let go like that. It was like... Break it hell, just but it basically because the weight was in my hand and then it just like let go. It like sprained my wrist and that was actually more painful than the bicep tear. Because it like shoots so, back up, doesn't it? Yeah, but it and was only like... it's only it didn't let. It's a muscular tear, not a tendon tear. Oh, good. So it didn't so it's roll a retraction up your arm. here. Yeah. So when I had all the scans done, it's you know retracted whatever 
amount, but as the the surgeon said to me, he goes, the tendon there is still intact, so no no need for surgery. Nothing oh, they good. can really do about yeah, it. Yeah, because I know I've had a few friends where it, like it comes off and it shoots up, and yeah. they pull it back down and reattach it. No, for, like, fortunately Jesus. it was yeah. So that that's the actual tendon and everything's still attached. So it's really just a muscle fiber tear. Mm. But just that enough letting go, like I said, that transferred onto my wrist and that was like, that was more painful. Mm. Um, so literally like my shoulder, like my whole arm was kind of messed up for about four months. So I remember like going back and just having to train like really, really lightly. Cause I, sorry, cause I thought that I'd be able to go to the surgeon and like my tricep, just get it fixed up mm-hmm. and everything would be hunky dory. But he did all the scans and he said, oh, there's a lot of like, everything's really worn down in there. And he goes, I'll fix it here. But your um your thin your tendons are thin in other places. So basically, I'll fix that. Great, but then you'll put pressure on other places. He said, if it's not causing a lot of pain, don't worry about it. Like just literally, just live with it. You know, mm. he goes, he knew I'd stop competing. Or again, sorry, that was part of that decision of like, um, you know, the the whole way the comp felt. If I had have been able to have surgery and stuff, I probably would have thought, oh maybe. But I was like, yeah. We'll leave it. It's 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 good. It doesn't hurt me that much. Um, so that was pretty much just that next year really was all about just trying to recover, um, relearn how to train because I mm. didn't have like literally one of my whole arms was functioning but not really functioning so well. So training was very, very light and, and mm. average. And so it was kind of transitioning from having, you know, been probably in condition of my life and as I said, my actual upper body size and every, not my size was – was very big because I had trained incredibly hard that mm. year. So it was dealing with that, like, you know, because yeah, your body's kind of like, ah, like yeah. going all over the place and, and everything. And so it took a, a good year to kind of get the training and everything back from that. And then what happened in between there is I realized that, as I said about how, you know, you change almost through each decade. So when I was competing, I literally would do two sessions of cardio a day, which would be walking outdoors, not really intense. Mm-hmm. Everything was fine. Everything nice. would come into condition. And then I realized that that really didn't work anymore, but not because the cardio, but as much as I wasn't burning the calories in the weight training that I was, mm. which we've talked about this a lot with the adrenal stress, the kind of limit that you're pushing yourself to. And that's what I keep coming back to. I had trained so friggin' hard that year. I'd trained heavy. I'd trained a lot of sets, a lot of volume. Intense. Intense. So there's a lot of calories being burnt. And then all of a sudden you can't train like that. So yeah, there, a there was a, a big difference through there. And that, and through that whole period, I realized I'm not even going close to that overload. So I'm there's, mm. there's uh, adrenal stresses that I'm not putting my body through, which is where a lot of the calorie burning, I believe, happens. Mm. Um, so I, I kind of had to relook at how I was doing my cardio and stuff. And that's really kind of how I got into F45 because it's a way more intense form of cardio. I hate the electronic machines, I call them. I hate like treadmills and ellipticals and all those things. Yeah, just the like conventional cardio. The, the yeah. soul destroying equipment, I call yes. I I hate it. Yep. So I was trying to do like hit on that and, and, and like <laughs> different, like if they, if you, like fortunately when I was in America a lot, they have like maybe five or six different types of machines. So I can do yeah, like variations. five minutes on that one and five minutes on that one and, five, and I can like, I can get away with it. You know, they had ski ergs before I saw one in Australia. They had um, some kind of thing which emulated doing skiing. So your legs were kind of going oh, different yes, weird yes. patterns and stuff. And, you know, little. and I'd never done a stair climber before. So I had like five minutes on the stair climber and then the rower and, and just everything that I could to try to like make that time go. A bit quicker, quicker. Not on one machine. Yeah, not the boredom. Yeah, and that, and as I say, so when I found F forty five, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is the le- this is how I need to work. Like, this is the level that I need to work at. Like, just yeah, a couple of walks a day isn't really doing much. So I have to burn my calories through here, mm. since not through the weight training. So the weight training, I do always go through phases where I'm like oh, I want to put on some size again, and then something happens, like injury. like injury. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, so I'm now at a point where, um, I. I've stopped trying to push heavier because it's, it's just been bad. Like between shoulders that, you know, that shoulder has those issues, but there's slap tears and bits and pieces Mm. and I don't know, all kind of stuff. Just not great. The forearm had a bit of a problem. So there's a bit of instability in there and I've got some like my nerves thickening over here and a bit of stuff going on there, which we're trying to find out about. And then the tear that I did on the, bicep up here so yeah things are kind of you know not going great from that perspective Mm. so i'm and this one here probably was what 
worried me the most because it wasn't really a warning signal. Like everything else that I've done, I'm like, yeah, I knew that was coming. I should yeah. have been smarter than that. I shouldn't have kept on doing what I was doing. Makes sense. This one, there was a tiny little bit of pain in the delt for a couple of weeks and then ping, out of nowhere. Not even doing like a weirdly heavy weight or anything. Mm. So that was kind of like a, a reminder that, oh, you know, that any little thing could potentially be a thing because I'm at that age where, you know, it's probably broken down enough that that could be a problem. So I'm actually doing some, like, I don't know if you've heard of the Kaiser method of rehab. I don't know if we talked about it last time. Mm. So um, I got introduced to that through our Molly, who was a uh, uh, marketing yes. person yes, beforehand. So Molly. her partner's a um, physio. physio at the Kaiser in Bundle. So they took me along to do some sort of strength testing. And it, what it, what they do Ooh. is they can pretty much set the range of motion and get you to do uh, basically a static contraction ah, yes. to measure that strength. And they have a lot of data from people your age group. What is it? Do you actually put it on? No, like, so it's a, um, they have, oh, like, I don't know how many pieces of equipment, but, like, literally there's the one for internal and external shoulder rotation. Right. There's forearm ones. There's oblique ones. I'm there's... just thinking, because I watched this video with, um, like, the physios from Man United, like, the top football players, and yeah. they had them in on this machine, and, like, you have to put, like, a wet suit on, oh. and you put these nodes all over it, and it has to be wet, and it uses electrical impedance, oh. and it sh it shocks well it doesn't it activates your muscles and you can turn it up but imagine just flexing and it just tenses them but then you have to go through ranges of motion they turn it up and you're like Ugh. so oh. it basically <laughs> makes your muscles twitch while you're going but you can understand how that could be it's very niche yeah but very um helpful for someone who might not be able to load like bearing from from like an actual weight bearing but but getting the same effect and I, it's, it's really nuanced it's like yeah. really high tech stuff well, but i was like oh that's interesting well that yeah like i mean it's a this is not as like you have to put a wetsuit on it's difficult but it's, it's yeah, yeah we were talking, say, it's yeah. not very it's not very uh, not practical like a, no it's yeah. practical is the word yeah but you know how we were talking about machines and machines being safe so yeah. basically the i guess the principle is that um you're in a machine so yeah. that you're safe and so it's you know Get, as I said, they can lock the range of motion. So if you have a pain in a certain range, then they can stop you from going through that range. Mm. But the idea is to either, you know, strengthen the stabilizer muscles or even the main muscles because for, you know, some people who have maybe not done anything for their whole life and they're quite old, um, they need to weight train to strengthen their basically their muscles for just mm -hmm. walking and stuff. So mm -hmm. they might have to do leg extensions and stuff. But again... They might have other issues, so they can kind of only put them through a certain range and build them up and then increase that range as mm. the strength comes. Because... I think I've used this machine. I had one yeah. when I was studying in New Zealand. Yeah. You well, can they... modify that. It's brilliant. Well, they, well, they like their setup is they would probably have like 30 or so machines. So mm. there's different like different ones for different things. For different, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's brilliant. So the, the testing the strength measures you against people of your own gender and age. So I had some very strong areas and i had some really weak areas considering that i've weight trained because it's, it's looking at a very yeah yeah like like, <laughs> like, like yeah like well, glute, strong, glute meds because again i never liked that like when i was younger they grew just through whatever i was training and then as i got older because my waist was thicker i'm like i actually don't like that because on the front from from mm. that when you're looking at me from the front of stage it looks like i have these massive pair of hips it doesn't look like i have glutes it looks it doesn't look good. Yeah. So yeah. avoiding that type of exercise and then to find that you have like, you're weaker than like the average woman your age who doesn't, <laughs> who just From a functional whatever. perspective, yeah, because the aesthetic goal wasn't there. Yeah. It's interesting. Like, okay, so we've got to do that exercise. But, but what their working thing is, is that you're overloading, but you're doing, you're aiming to do it for between 90 and 120 seconds. Mm. And the reps take 12 seconds. So you're like four moving to pause but not resting four seconds negative mm. two seconds hold so each one rep is 12 seconds so the aim is to get 10 reps it's hard and sounds easy until you do it and then you're until like, you do it when when you're, when like, you're oh not gosh. working at that limit it's easy and then once you start like okay yeah i'm real, like i'm failing in that 90 to 120 it's freaking hard mm. so i've been doing that and i've already noticed like the difference in my stability through my shoulders um That's for things like um, shoot throughs and stuff like that that you do at F45 because you do a lot of like shoulder planted work mm. um, whether it be what do we call them mountain climbers and all that type of stuff where you're using your shoulders and whatnot. so that's definitely helped and I'm doing a lot of work with my forearms because again when I'm training heavy 
forearms naturally got worked. When you don't train so heavy, they really aren't doing so much at all. So that's, you know, that loss of strength through there is impacting my elbow because it's like putting all of the pressure mm. onto there instead the of some. Yeah. yeah, so we're working through a lot of that stuff. But um, it, yeah, it, it's it's hard work <laughs> when you're doing this little very intense movement, but you're doing it so slowly. So it is a form of overload. They're still using that, but it's safety because you can't drop out of the wrong, like you can't get in the wrong position basically. Mm. Like the, the rotator cuff one is amazing because if you ever try to do that with the dumbbell and you always feel like there's that angle that it goes yeah. through where there's a, the gravity is pulling it in the wrong way. Mm. So you're basically, um, you know, you're either kind of pushing forward or pushing back depending on how you set the machine up and actually working where you're supposed to work. So mm. yeah, I find that um, it's good. definitely different. So my, I guess my goal now is to um, be able to work the muscle in a different way, like, I don't think I'm going to get muscle growth out of that, but I'm definitely going to get strength and stability, which then may lead to better function in the gym. I am finding that, but at the same time, I'm very mindful of what else is going on with my tendons and whatnot. So my goal is to be able to train and be active, mm. relatively pain-free. So it's, it's to keep um, you know as much aesthetic as possible, but it's that it is have to be a total Filling mind... The gaps. All of the little things. Yeah. yeah. Just to make sure nothing's neglected. And and yeah, so now I do stretching as well. Like you're talking about that long mm. um long hold stretching mm. and stuff like, like two that. Minutes plus sort of thing. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So I do one of them one of those classes a week. Well that's and good, but it's just like I think um where I was going with that before is I think just pe people just come in the gym though, they do it before weight training and they're on their phone and I'm like, You're not holding it for two minutes. You're actually you're you're sort of halfway between doing something semi effective. Mm. Where it's like, yeah, a dedicated, because I did yoga for a while as well. I mean, I like stretching. It's good. I just think, again, it's a tool and people use it and put it in the wrong place. Well, And they amalgamate things. And they, but everyone just does the same thing. And I'm like, why are you all doing that? Because, like people yeah. come and get the dumbbells and they just stand in front of the mirror and do this. I'm like, what are yeah. you doing? What are you doing? Why are you, do you have a, I said to people, do you have a rotator cuff? One doesn't work rotator cuff because yep. you need to load it this way. And I said, why are you doing that? And they're like, a oh, warm up. And I said, well, what are you warming up? And they're like, shoulders I said have you got anything wrong with your shoulders is there any pain they're like no I'm like well what are you doing today I'm doing I'm training upper body okay what are you trying to what's your goal I'm trying to get bigger sugar okay so what about a dynamic stretch move blood flow around something generic and then what about something specific so maybe a lighter version of it with dumbbells mm. or the weight and they're like yeah so because like if you've not got anything wrong with that and one it's not even working that then why would you want to do that and they're like oh and i'm like you've seen someone do that haven't you they're like yeah and i'm like yeah. so i might like, you break i'm trying to get them to see the logic because i don't want to demoralize people i want to help people i want to yeah. i want people to see the logic so they can go ah actually yeah if i'm trying to do x why am i doing y especially when y doesn't even match up with my goal well, and that's Time I think, to place I think tools. It, the, the thing of coming back to like, what are your goals? Mm. And I think a lot of us either don't have goals and it's really, it's quite interesting because as I said, I've been listening to a lot of more like business orientated mm. stuff because, um, you know, obviously the nutrition side of it, I'm like, oh yeah, I, yeah, I don't want to, I, I will go research stuff on that, but I want to listen to stuff which will help my business. Mm. And one of the people I've been listening to is a guy who, he, I, I don't know if you've heard of Alex Her Hormozy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. So, and I'm his, all over that And stuff his analogies it. with like, because obviously the, the exercise side of things and then the, you know, with the business side of things. And that one of the things that he was saying was kind of exactly that, but around morning routines. So good. Just like, get did you, it. did you listen oh, to I've that? I've read all his books oh. and done all his courses and I'm actually, I'm going to be getting him on the podcast. He's oh, really, yeah. He's, he's phenomenal. Pheno yeah. He's such a smart guy, but. But the, he just breaks it down. Yeah. And makes it simple. But that's what but that's what I'm saying about the, the routine thing. He's saying people see XYZ person's routine oh, and I've got to meditate and do this. And he's like, they're three hours into the day before they've even started <laughs> their day. And it defeats the purpose. <laughs> yeah. But when you but when he breaks it down in a minute in logic, you're like, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like okay, okay, you're adding all of these he goes, You don't have enough time, but you're adding all of this stuff in which doesn't serve what you're trying to do, which takes time. Mm. Like but the interesting thing that I find with that is that he's early 30s and a lot of the stuff that and this is when i'm talking about what's right for 20 year old 30 year old 40 year old mm, 50 year old mm. is a lot of he's just like well you should just get in there and work and i'm like well okay when you're 50 you are gonna have to take a little more care of yourself yeah, like concept. you can't just like roll out of bed and then have a coffee and get into work so but a lot of the routines that people are looking at are from older people 
like because they want to have their meditation they want to do their gratefulness and they probably they got want the to do time the... and the money to do that e- exactly so it fits their lifestyle he's still at an energy level at an age bracket and everything where he's wanting to be okay yeah i can get in and do this and you know my this happens over here and he doesn't need to worry about a lot of the stuff that as you get older, you need to worry about that stuff. So and you don't know about that till you get there because you can it, only look back at where you've been, but you don't know where you're going. It, so yeah. that that perspective is really difficult from like you can do it from like one way looking back, but you can't look forward to it unless you try and speak to someone with more life experience and then try and empathize and ascertain. Yeah, oh, actually, but, but at the same time, you don't need it for what you're doing at that point in time. Exactly. So and I know a lot of these guys, they... And, and again, I suppose him in particular, because I I've only kind of just come across him, so I haven't Good. I haven't listened to a lot of his mm. stuff. But he's talking about how he's been doing his podcast for was it like five years or something, and he's going back and kind of like rethinking some of the stuff because mm. he's like, oh, my perspectives changed since mm. when I did it first time, and that's and it. That's, and it always will. I, I yeah. think like with the minute sound bites, so people got to remember like that's a minute. So he's just trying okay. to give juice, and he's trying to give something which is controversial. Uh, to a degree or like very like oh yeah that's brilliant but then it's you know you just like we get this podcast and what i could say something on a minute video but then in my head i'm like oh there's so much context i need to give to that but then mm. it wouldn't be a minute video so i'm like okay if you want to learn more about this because don't take that sound bite and now quote me for everything because that's unfair yeah but i get it so it's like oh you want to actually understand about thermodynamics okay well we're going to need a little bit more time so go to the youtube video and that's only 20 minutes so now you need a little bit more so now we've got our podcast oh we need a bit more we're probably going to need coaching and education yeah so so, yeah, everything kind of has to be framed in that way yeah. where there's only so much you can communicate. Like, the soundbite's nice, but then when we actually extrapolate it, it's like, okay, there's a yeah, bit well, more it's, nuance. It's like anything, a headline off of a newspaper. When you read the actual article, it's nothing actually no, really about attention. Fair, yeah, <laughs> exa- otherwise, you wouldn't even have bothered to read it in the first place. But, um, but yeah, that and that was another thing that he was saying, and this mm. is so relevant to, you know, whether it be nutrition, whether it be trading or whether it be business or anything, but mm. talking about how people will be with a coach or a mentor mm. Um, mm. in a certain period and then kind of go on to a next person and be like, oh, they were trash. It's like, no, you weren't ready for that at anything else at that stage. And he was kind of likening it to like, you know, you're teaching a kindergarten kid a certain thing or teaching a kid the alphabet mm. And then they go to the next phase and then they go to the next phase. So it's the same thing with training. Like sometimes, again, people are either looking at what people 20 years their senior are doing. Yes. They don't need to do it or they think they would trash a previous coach, but the previous coach had them where they were at that time and was yeah. working with them with what where they were at on their overall journey or their overall progress. So mm. people kind of have to keep that in mind that – you're here, you're not there. So you got to kind of work with there. This is too much for you at this stage. And if something one surpasses you and you've helped them, then that means you've obviously done a pretty good job. Yeah. Which is what he was saying too, which is, yeah. it's, which is an intro. Yeah. That's the, you know, a lot of people don't really get that. It's like, well, if you are good and you have passed on knowledge, maybe that person can get to where you got faster. Mm. You know, I like to look at that sometimes because I, I often like, you know, with the people I coach, I'm like, Oh, fuck man where would i have been if someone had taught me this but i'm like well that's good but i can't change it but what i can do is if i want to pay it forward as i'm doing i can mm. help other people if they're willing to listen and take that and go hmm okay let you don't need let me help you avoid all this because you don't need any of that uh, yeah. and i'm just going to give you the things that i always roi is what i talk about people i'm like look let's based on and that's where the coaching comes in because you know we always talk about like programs and nutrition i'm like look there's only so many foods out there that are worth eating and you know that you can eat and there's only so many exercises you can do before you start making them up so let's just it depends on where you're at but mm. the coaching is how we do it how we place it, how we strategize it in your lifestyle, your skill, your development, your age. I'm like, that's the fun of coaching. That's where the fun comes in. And I think the individual experience got personalized. Yeah. Gotta be personalized. I'm like, yes, 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 it does. But that doesn't mean you have to write a different program. Like the program, like you'd have to make up an exercise for every different client. I'm like, everyone's gonna do a squat variation, but someone might do a barbell squat, someone might do a box squat, someone might do a hack squat, someone might do a body weight squat. Hell, you might not be able to squat yet. Yeah. So do you know what I mean? Like, it, but it's knowing, and I think with experience, you get good at being able to quickly discern where someone is and give them something that is is gonna be. Um, uh, advantageous for them to progress where they're at which is what you were saying like depending on where you're at a good coach will go hey you know what for you right now this is the th- this is yeah. where your time and energy should be and then you can progress and okay now it's this thing yeah because because uh, otherwise they're you know again if it's too advanced for them they're gonna i guess kind of get disheartened or, or lose interest or not understand of course and then if they're beyond that they're like what is this garbage like yeah. <laughs> 
not getting this anything is, out of yeah, this. Yeah, this is this a little bit boring or something. But yeah, I think <laughs> the nuance. The, yeah. the I think as he was saying, yeah, the implementation of it is often where people struggle. You could have all of the theory in the world, mm. but if you're not quite sure how to block it together, what sequence to do things in, you know, why you're doing things, then that that's where people kind of need that little bit of help and mm. i was thinking like that that was the first time i could kind of really relate it back to the the training side of things so yeah it's mm. um you know it's one thing to kind of people know that they know the exercises but how to actually structure that program how many days a week they should be doing it when you know when they should be pushing that weight up because that is something where like you said when we're talking earlier a person thinks they're at failure but they still might have like 15 reps to go because they they don't even, they haven't even really hit that comfort zone or that trying mm. zone and and it's it's having that person to kind of know you well enough to judge that there is actually more in there mm. because there's mm. nothing worse than someone pushing someone when they're yeah, way they're not, not up to yeah, it because that's a whole different it. thing you know? it is and i think that yeah. there is the that's the little dichotomy about that mm. because people go oh i need train or failure i'm like yeah but you have to earn that in terms of like you can't just go in the gym and train to failure because one you don't need to mm. straight away but two also you don't have the skill acquisition like you need to be able to because a lot of people you know like you see people when they, they panic and they move their feet and they do this and you're like whoa whoa don't do that under load especially not yeah. the free weight so it's like you have to build up this mental fortitude to kind of go right this is really hurting right now but i can still maintain my form and i can still you know work through the pain and mm. then go yeah cool now i'm like silence that noise but i can still focus on what i need to focus on that's where a machine is really good initially i always use like a leg press yeah when i get someone to a certain level i'm like all right this is really good we've got the safeties up right there's only really when you got a push like yeah if, you're if, thinking about one thing you don't have yeah. to stabilize yeah, and yeah. The, and literally like mentally you're just push yeah yeah like that's, it's yeah. not like under a barbell i'll be like mm, yeah no nah, let's not yeah, let's not go so anywhere go wrong because <laughs> one one leg is going to push more than the other leg and you're going to end up like tipping over it's or not, it's not a good idea you're going <laughs> to get to failure and you're not going to be able to rack it yeah like that's the, that's always to me that in in my mind if i'm on the wrong squat rack always would lose about two reps yeah because of that fear of i still need to be able to step forward yes stand up on my tippy toes get this thing in yep. all of those things and if you've got the the gym with the perfect height one where you can just like pop it in yeah you're comfortable to go that extra couple of reps because you don't you can just like i'm in the rack yeah but literally. yeah probably my biggest fear in, in any exercise is that that moment of getting that bar back in the rack <laughs> yeah especially when there's a lot of load on it as well like yeah so heart attack moments wrong. like please please and now i see on instagram where it does go wrong i'm like oh man i avoided oh, that oh yeah 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 gym yeah. fail videos are all the rage I've seen... <laughs> i i wanted to ask before my final question which i ask all my guests um before that to kind of uh, encompass and you know, i ask you what your fitness goals were now at the moment but yeah. i wanted to know maybe like career wise as well maybe more in the realms of like international protein or nutrition or your personal area of, of interest like what your goals are like the vision going forward there and then we'll move on to the the final signature question okay well i guess um it's it's trying to oh, that's a it's a bit of a tough one. Mm. But international protein you know we've been around for 20 odd years yes. and we you know we started pre any kind of e-commerce, internet selling, you know, very much bricks and mortar. Uh, so I guess we're trying to look at, you know, how can we grow in the space of, you know, more of the digital space, hence why I've been like learning a lot of this kind of stuff and, mm. and just, you know, utilising what tools are out there now. Because when we started, it was, you know, you did taste testings, it was word of mouth, going to competitions, just being around people and, and that. And that's still a big part of it because the business is, you know, we sell in shops, like that's, that's who sells our product. But mm there's a whole generation of people that look in other directions for their information. And we want to be kind of capturing those people because we, I still believe that our products are the best, you know, they don't stand the test of time if they weren't. And I think mm. that's probably one of the best things and like wanting to, you know, we developed them because we knew they were good and we want to have people still getting access to them, especially in a, a world where it is very confusing and, and there's so much kind of con contradictory stuff. Mm. So it's like, how do we reach those people and serve them? Uh, because we know they're good. We know they're getting something good, but they're missing it because if they're not, if we're not in that space. Mm. So that's kind of one of the things that we're doing. Um, you know, obviously we've got our own podcast coming back relatively soon, Muscle Talk. It's exciting. It is. It's very exciting. We're going to change the format on that one a little bit and have guests, um, whereas before it was, you know, pretty much a monologue. So that I think is just going to, you know, grow our reach and grow a different kind of audience, but also be able to help people just with, you know, mm. information around training, around nutrition, it's going to be, you know, quite diverse because, you know, we'll have a, a lot of different 
type of people on, mm. even just athlete stories and, and, you know, kind of give people, you know, inspiration of what is possible, um, you know, mindset, obviously a huge part of it. Um, but also he wanted, you know, launch into the States using that method rather mm. than a bricks and mortar kind of mm. a method. So that's, you know, the next 12 months um, we want to be there, but it's quite, you know, we, we have to do it very differently to what we did it back in the old days. Um, just because it's a, you know it's a different world and and how people you know how consumers think how they use products how products are delivered um, you know also because we have a range but we can't just launch a whole range you kind of have to do it one by one and and you know we're twenty years old but we're kind of zero years old in yep. other ways so it's like training everything evolves yeah and you got and uh, you know people don't want to keep up with it but you got to we yeah it's well, just, unfortunately it's just things that you you have to do if you really want to expand that reach and um like yeah. you said sometimes it's not what it used to be but there's still derivatives of it yeah and and i think the thing is you know being recognizing that it's not my strength like mm. it's not a you know uh, social media for me is like hey it's kind of fun but it's kind of annoying it is so, <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, it's a full-time job mate. It, <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and there's so many um, so many other things to be doing in that so um and and but that's you know, other people love doing that sort of stuff. So that it's, it's getting building that team yeah, out to be able to do that to empower them. Yeah, which yeah. is which is a good thing. But it, but it really is, you know, not you know, it's it's a pro, it's a product which is there. You know, well, it's a range of products which are there because they work and because they're good. And we kind of want people to discover that um, as as part of mm. you know, there's a lot of product out there, but why has ours stood the test of time? Because you know, if people don't like something or if it's not working for them they will switch over onto something else. And the fact that we're still here, still strong, it's just a matter of then people discovering us. I think that's where it's at at the moment. Once they mm. discover us, then it's like, oh, hey, this stuff actually is good. It's legit. Yeah. Well, it is, yeah. I was speaking to um, Sal the other day at Elite Supplements, and he's getting me the whole international protein range in so I can just get my clients to go downstairs cool. because most people just want to go into a shop. Yeah, well, a which, which again, Australia is very different <sighs> like that. We want to go into a shop. Well, that's it, you know, because <laughs> yeah. got, we've got the online at STN, but then a lot of my, you know, clients are like, can I just kind of get it anywhere? Like EMF have it as well. And I'm like, look, can we get some more stuff in? Yeah, no, but yeah. Sal's like, I'll get everything in for you. Cool. And he just gets it done. I'm like, great. So that way people can go downstairs and kind of interact with the product, which I think is important. <laughs> I, I think, Do you know what I mean? Like I people think, like to touch and feel. It's an old school thing, but it's like we're kind of losing that. Well, I think that's the thing where Australia really does differ so dramatically from a lot of other countries where mm. we are that culture that likes that. Like we like the interaction, you know, like say touch, feel the product, talk about it, talk about our training, talk about gym because it's, it's our life. You yeah. know? So to be able to go and see the shopkeeper or the, you know, the guy in the store, mm. talk about what you've done, what's new. Um, and then also, yeah, there's something about physically seeing a product, you know, being able to read it. Like I know you can read it on screen and all that type of stuff, but there's just, it's something different. Builds trust. Yeah. But I see different like overseas or in America in particular is a little bit different yeah. where people, I think go f kind of first for online. Yeah. Um, I think they go for price and like, like they just want to get it in bulk and things like that. So it's sort of like, there's that kind of like, oh, it's easy. It's the online, everything's online shopping. Yeah. I mean, they like the, the, there's still a hardcore group that mm. do, do, get, do oh, go sure. to the stores, but it, yes. but for the population size, it's way smaller. Cause you know, there's like, it, it's funny cause you walk into a, a store anywhere in the world and yeah, the, you know, conversation, if you know something about weight training and stuff, it, it you know, and I do still look like I train. So that topic comes up straight away, you know, with the person who owns the store and you can have that conversation and, you know, see what products they've got. Why are they stocking what they're stocking and everything? But as I said, you can kind of count those stores on your hand. Yeah. Um, as compared to Australia where there's like hundreds of, of stores like that. So that, that's been interesting. So it's also a big part of why we need to figure out, a, you know, how we're going to communicate that across to people who mm. do look for their information in other ways. But um, yeah, if, if everyone was like here and, actually like to go into a store and that it would be it'd be you know way way easier because you can you we know how to control that or not control it we know how to um to optimize that and, mm. and you know put information to the people in the stores and and you know that's what our reps do like they will talk about it and, and that communicate in that way so yeah but that's the that's i guess the international protein side of things um as i said you know we've got the podcast mm. coming back um, looking at also, you know, being more in the modern way and looking at doing collabs and, and different things to kind of really drive particular products and put focus on some of our other products. Because obviously, you know, the w, Amino Charge WPI is, you know, such a big, big product. Mm. Um, but things like our Rip to Shreds, which I think are brilliant products, mm -hmm. but a little bit probably misunderstood because they don't have like a massive amount of caffeine 
there's a reason for that that doesn't need it. Yeah, uh, and but, it needs context and nuance and communication. So yeah. people really go, okay, cool. Because people just look at certain numbers and compare and go, if it's a bigger number, it's a better product. It's like, there's so much more than that. But again, how do we make it fun? How do you make it like, you know, engaged with it? Like, because you do, you have to make, you know, people, how are you going to get people to connect with it? Yeah. You can't just tell them. It's not enough. These days, exactly. Unfortunately. Exactly. So, yeah, so it's all of those things, but, you know, focusing on up, on the other products in the range because it's, mm. you know, WPI is, you know, the king, so to speak, um, and, and um, working through that. And I think once we get better at doing that, then, you know, look at what else, what other products you want to do. But um, right now I think we've, we've got most of that pretty pretty covered with that mm. um yeah so that's that's really the the main thing i think that and just really growing the, that's a podcast will be obviously um you know promoting the product in a way but at the same mm. time it's really about just promoting fitness wellness bodybuilding still a heavy heavy focus on bodybuilding because i still think that that's you know that people who actually want to grow their physiques is who our market is you know people yes. who, are, who are wanting either to compete or to be bigger um, you know, I, I keep getting, you know, pointed in the direction of wellness and, and healthiness and all this sort of stuff. I'm like, no, our, our people actually want to put on muscle. Like that's, you know, that's what they're about. And that's what that's the great. branding represents. I think so as well. Yeah. Like yeah. when I look at international protein, like before I knew anything really about the product back in the day, I looked at it, I looked at the images, the brand, I was like, yeah, this seems a bit more like elite, like yeah. people who like want to go maybe that next level, like yeah. really like they're focused on physique aesthetics performance that sort of thing you know in yeah. the gym bodybuilding like you said you know yeah. building the body it, it's more yeah like you know things like the timing of what you're having mm. and, and the specific formulations and why we put certain things in mm. it's not just okay let's slap it slap out a protein and, and go hey it's protein because everyone can do that and because everyone needs protein but we're a little bit more nuanced than that and that's exactly. because you know you're, you're working in that level uh like you say where you know if you are working to fatigue fa failure because you're working at your optimal you need something different to someone who is just working at average mm. and that's you know where, where we've always kind of positioned ourselves that you know you you may not be an elite athlete but you're actually you know, you're actually trying to work at your optimal and mm. and you know higher than average so you need more than just the average person so yeah exactly it's exciting yeah. times and it to lead in, because we'll, we'll talk about this more as well, and then we'll, we'll share more of it, I'm sure, in the links to Muscle Talk. We're going to call it Muscle Talk? Yes. I think yeah. I think we're going to keep Muscle Talk because that's what we um, – I think it already – it always started. I like it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it yeah. makes sense. Based on what you just said, it's like, well, we're talking about muscle. Muscle, yeah. <laughs> now, this question I ask all my guests, and it's interesting because I feel like I always arrive at somewhat the same answer, um, but we're going to see. And it's, you know, can you identify if there's a specific fear – in your life that you've had or still have that really resonates with you that has a significance that you've had to overcome or perhaps you're still overcoming and what you've learned from that fear oh, you that i may have a different answer i'm not I, sure but to I go have, for it because it's unique go for it. it's unique i i try to be fearless oh hey there so you that's... go look at that look at that <laughs> I, I, fearless training i was thinking just that got a I'm new client <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even no, pay to say that. But, but, but I think that is one of the things of like... That's a sound bite. <laughs> <laughs> it's right there. Yeah, <laughs> as in, it, you, like, fear of doing something is what holds you back. Yeah. So, to me, I, I've, yeah, it, it's just going for it, doing it. Yeah. And, mm. you know, that's, that's literally it. Like, people have even said that to me, that I seem to be fearless because I will just... I don't think twice about, mm. you know going somewhere or doing something or mm. just launching into something. We maybe don't, you know, maybe it doesn't work out. Mm. Hey, doesn't matter. But Welcome even just you know, everything, travel, um, go somewhere I don't know, I'm going to find my way around in that place. Other people don't want to do that. Training, I guess you know, never even thought twice about how people would react to me because that wasn't really a thing. Like I'm just going to go do it. Mm. So I think you have to really try to be fearless. Mm. I mean, not of... I, yeah, I'm scared of walking in front of the bus, yeah, and yeah, you know, yeah. I think that's I don't want to drop yeah, the weight on myself. That's, yeah, that, there's, there's, there's there's a stupidity, and yeah. then there's being fearful. Yeah, yeah, there's sen mean, sensible I... fear. Yeah, but um, in terms of um, you know, fear of what someone's going to say about mm. you, fear of is this going to work out or not, um, you know, those type of of fears. You, you can't afford to have them. It's like regret and fear. Mm. You can't live on those. You can't live with those things. So. 
I'm not quite sure what other answers people have, but that's yeah. that's my my take on it. That's great. Well, no, yeah. that's it, I want your honest opinion. I mean, obviously, it resonates with me greatly. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's a unresounding, <laughs> phenomenal way to round up uh, the part two of the podcast, which has yeah. been great. So, I, I want to thank you for your time. No I know worries. it's been really insightful. I talked to you all day, and I'm sure we will more on other yes, platforms. We will. <laughs> I've got some other ideas as well, which I think will be great for the viewers. But um, until the next time, you know, we'll put all the links in the description. We'll probably pop a link into Muscle talk because by the time this is out or when it's out maybe it's going to be coming up soon so we might so. We, we might do that and obviously we'll put the links to international protein for people who want obviously premium products at a higher level which will be great and obviously the links in there and uh yeah wrap up any any uh, ending thoughts for you that you want to leave the listeners and the watchers with stay strong that's what i st- yeah as yeah in, no, because it's size is out of it everything else is out of it it's it's staying strong because it's has a different connotation as you get older Mm -hmm. but staying strong is everything stay strong and stay fearless guys you already know like comment subscribe and of course share it pay it forward see you in the next one